My arms were badly burned and there seemed to be something dripping from my fingertips. I saw a schoolgirl with her eye hanging out of its socket. People looked like ghosts, bleeding and trying to walk before collapsing. I looked down and saw a man clutching a hole in his stomach, trying to stop his organs from spilling out. The smell of burning flesh was overpowering. That's an answer to the question of what happened after the Manhattan Project. It's a description of what one survivor of the atomic bomb said happened right after the bomb hit his hometown of Hiroshima in the morning of August 6, 1945. We are sure you know now what this project was all about, creating a nuclear bomb. Three days after the Hiroshima blast in the city of Nagasaki was hit, in all reports tell us that these two warheads named Little Boy and Fat Man killed in total 295,325 in Hiroshima and 165,409 in Nagasaki. The devastation was unparalleled. The world had never seen such destruction, and the scientists working on the Manhattan Project had done their job well. The Allied politicians and military men rejoiced. The upstart Japan was shocked to its core, sent down to its knees. It was a disturbing coup de grace at the end of the Second World War, a death blow and a warning of things that might come. That warning remained in people's minds for years. We're still aware of what power governments possess to wipe out masses of populations with the push of a button, but thankfully, we no longer sit on our sofas chilled to the bone as some TV program tells us what to do when the strike comes. Thankfully, the powers that be know very well that any kind of nuclear attack is a zero-sum game, tit for tat everyone loses. We might now ask the question, what were those guys thinking when they decided to work on a project that could possibly end with large parts of humanity being blitzed from existence? That's what we're going to answer today. It actually all started in Germany, because it was there that three very clever men called Otto Hahn, Leis Meitner, and Fritz Strassmann discovered nuclear fission. What does that mean? Well, it's basically… Uh, We'll let a scientist explain. Nuclear fission is a reaction wherein a heavy nucleus is bombarded by neutrons and thus becomes unstable, which causes it to decompose into two nuclei with equivalent size and magnitude, with a great detachment of energy and the emission of two or three neutrons. There's a crude term for this and that is splitting the atom. All that energy released can be a dangerous thing, as described by the Japanese man who witnessed carnage all around him on that dark day in 45. Anyway, after this discovery, the word on the lab concourse was that it could possibly be used to make a bomb, a very powerful bomb. The Germans were on it and word got out to the Allied powers that some scientists over there were working on creating extremely powerful bombs of a new type. But to cut a long story short, scientists all over the place were aware of the potential of creating a big bomb using nuclear fission. President Franklin D. Roosevelt got a team together, and it was agreed that uranium was needed because it could provide a possible source of bombs with a destructiveness vastly greater than anything now known. They knew this because an Italian man called Enrico Fermi had been working on nuclear chain reactions. He's sometimes called the architect of the nuclear age. It was discovered that uranium isotopes called U-235 and U-238 could be used for the fission needed to create the explosion, but the former was better. Over in Britain, they had their own project to create an atomic bomb, and that was led by an Austrian scientist called Otto Fritsch and a German-born British man called Rudolf Perls. We don't want to bombard you with lots of names, but you should know the making of the atomic bomb was a massive collaboration and not some eureka moment for some lone wolf messing about with isotopes in a dimly lit lab. Over in the UK, they thought they discovered a way to actually create such a bomb small enough to be carried by a bomber plane. This was big news, and it didn't escape the Americans. In the US, they soon discovered that the British atomic bomb project was bigger and more advanced. Britain then told America that it could have access to any of its scientists and scientific research relating to the atomic bomb. But the problem for a while was that this research didn't always get to the right people in the USA. It was actually an Australian physicist, Mark Oliphant, who managed to visit the states and say, hey physicists, there is a lot of stuff you just haven't seen that those winging palms have been working on. We doubt he said it like that, but soon enough anyway, the American physicists had a lot to work with. Okay, so we'll have to cut a very long story into a shorter story. 
so we know lots of people were collaborating on this project from many places and we know there was a very real fear that the Germans were ahead. Let's now think of the USA coming in and corralling all these scientists so they could communicate the work under one roof. This was by order of the president and the military would take control of the project. Not that politicians or military men knew much about nuclear fission, so an American physicist called Robert Oppenheimer was made director. He's sometimes called the father of the atomic bomb, but as we said, this was a complicated endeavor and there was no one inventor. This project was codenamed the Manhattan Project by the American military, but also had the official codename of Development of Substitute Materials. One of those names would stick. The race was on. This is how General Leslie Groves and the Chief of Foreign Intelligence for the Manhattan Project explained why this race was so important. The Manhattan Project was built on fear. Fear that the enemy had the bomb, or would have it before we could develop it. The scientists knew this to be the case because they were refugees from Germany, a large number of them, and they had studied under the Germans before the war broke out. Another leading scientist on the project said this, I think everyone was terrified that we were wrong and that the Germans were ahead of us. Germany led the civilized world of physics in every aspect. At the time war set in when Hitler lowered the boom, it was a very frightening time. The thing is, all these people couldn't have been further from knowing the truth. They were leaps ahead of the Germans, and that's partly because they had some of the best German scientists who had all defected on board. Still, the Manhattan Project had to be huge and it was costly. It said in all about 130,000 people worked on it, and it cost about $2 billion. That might not sound like much, but it would be somewhere in the region of $25 billion in today's money. For the Germans and the Allies, the problem was creating something out of extremely difficult to create raw materials that could be dropped from the sky and then detonated. This was no easy task and huge factories and labs had to be built to make it a reality. As one German scientist said after he'd heard about Hiroshima, it must have taken factories large as the United States to make that much uranium-235. Just so you know, the first bomb was dropped by parachute from a US B-29 bomber called Enola Gay. The bomb exploded 600 feet above the ground. At the point of the explosion, the air temperature was around 1 million degrees Celsius. On the ground at the hypocenter, the temperature was between 3,000 and 4,000 degrees Celsius. A mushroom cloud rose about 10,000 feet. A fascinating thing to see to some people from far away. But below lay the ruins of a Japanese city and its scorched and dead inhabitants. A few minutes before that, lots of people were said to be looking up at the sky, wondering what those bombers were doing. We tell you this because in the 1940s, this is exactly what the scientists were trying to create. For years, materials were collected and scientists worked on how to create this bomb. In 1942, two plants built reactors to create plutonium, and also electromagnetic centrifuge and gaseous diffusion plants were built to produce uranium-235. In 1943, raw materials were very much being created, but then bomb design had to be thought about. In 1944, bomb models were tested, and later that year dummy bombs called pumpkins were dropped in tests. In early 1945, leaders Roosevelt, Churchill, and Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin all met to discuss the imminent end of the war. Not long after the American leader died, his last words were, I have a terrific headache. A few months later, and a plutonium implosion bomb was tested in New Mexico. The new President Truman then told Stalin that America had an ace in the hole, a bomb like no other. On July 26th, President Truman, Chinese President Chiang Kai-shek, and the new British Prime Minister Clement Attlee issued the Postum Proclamation to Japan, asking that the country give up the fight and surrender. A few days later, and Japan replied, no. As you know, on August 6th, the little man was dropped, and three days later, Nagasaki was hit. On August 14th, Japan surrendered. That's the end of the Manhattan Project, a multilingual global project that cost a ton of money and human life. In case you're wondering how all that science fit into one place at the end of the day, it goes a bit like this. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima acted a bit like a gun. It was tube-shaped with half of a nuclear charge at one end and the other half, the moving part, at the other end. A normal explosive charge was put behind the moving part, and you might say that was the near end of the barrel. When the charge was detonated, the bullet went down the tube and hit the charge at the other end, sometimes called the spike. Then the two halves of the nuclear materials were brought together and held together, and the result of this was a chain reaction. The fuel became what's called supercritical, and the explosion came next. The Manhattan Project was both a success and a bloody wart on the history of mankind. 
Some might say these weapons of mass destruction might have prevented other wars, but that's a debate we're not going to get into today. We'll leave you with the words of Oppenheimer, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. A flash of blinding light fills the sky. 70,000 civilians living in Hiroshima are killed in an instant. In the years to come, 70,000 more will die from radiation poisoning. Three days later, a second atomic bomb is dropped on Nagasaki, annihilating 40,000 men, women, and children. The United States has detonated the first and only atomic bombs ever used in a war, but in doing so, they may have saved millions of lives. Did the end justify the means? The answer to this question will make you sick to your stomach and question your morality. On December 7, 1941, Japanese forces bombed Pearl Harbor. Bombs dropped from the sky, slamming into the hulls of U.S. naval ships. The Japanese frantically searched the waters for their main targets, but they were nowhere to be found. The goal of the attack on Pearl Harbor was to destroy the United States Pacific Fleet, and the only way to do that was to eliminate its aircraft carriers. However, several of the ships were not docked at the naval base at the time of the attack as they were out on assignment in the Pacific. This included three aircraft carriers that the Japanese were hoping to destroy. Over 2,400 Americans lost their lives during the surprise attack. From that point on, most of the American population wanted revenge for the men lost at Pearl Harbor. In fact, this single moment in history would set in motion events that would result in the deaths of millions over the course of three and a half years. After entering World War II in the Pacific, the United States was forced to play a deadly game of cat and mouse with Japan. Their armies hopped from one island to the next, costing men and resources. The goal of each side was to control as much of the Pacific waters as possible. For the United States, it was a matter of maintaining a foothold in the region to launch attacks on Japan's main island and end the war. For the Japanese, it was a battle to keep control of their power and force the United States back across the Pacific to their mainland. There were massive amounts of casualties on both sides. Civilians that inhabited the islands of the Pacific and East Asia were caught up in a war they had no desire to be in. Unfortunately, they did not have the power to stop the two nations from ravaging their homelands. Neither side would back down, so drastic decisions needed to be made. The decision to drop the atomic bombs on Japan started with the most bloody conflict in the Pacific, the battle for Okinawa. U.S. forces made their way closer and closer to Japan. The Japanese knew that if they lost Okinawa, an invasion of their homeland was imminent. Each side had everything to lose when the battle started. The U.S. codenamed the incursion of Okinawa Operation Iceberg. On April 1, 1945, the United States launched the largest amphibious assault in the history of the Pacific Theater. Boats and amphibious vehicles cruised through the water loaded with soldiers. When they reached the shores of the island, the ramps lowered and Marines flooded onto the beaches. They immediately met heavy resistance. The Imperial Japanese Army already had a stronghold on the island, and they would not give up so easily. In fact, the Japanese would rather fight to the very last man than surrender this strategic location. The main objective for U.S. forces was to take Kadena Air Base, which would serve then as a launching point for Operation Downfall, the name given to the invasion of Japan. Thousands of Allied ships, planes, and vehicles carried out attacks across the island, but the Japanese were dug in and ready. They launched kamikaze counteroffensive and made sure to strike key targets to slow the Allied advance. It was a bloodbath for both sides. The Battle of Okinawa resulted in the highest number of casualties of any battle in the Pacific. It's estimated that somewhere around 160,000 military personnel died while fighting for control of the island. The United States lost close to 50,000 men, while Japan lost somewhere between 80,000 and 115,000 people. The saddest part is that the biggest loss of life was for the Okinawans themselves. Nearly half of the 300,000 people who lived on the island before the attack died during the battle. Some were forced to enlist in the Japanese army, while others were innocent victims caught in the firefights and bombings that took place across the island. After months of fighting, the United States secured victory on the island and gained control of the airfield. However, even once the majority of Japanese forces were defeated, the Americans still had to contend with guerrilla fighters and small Japanese units sprinkled around the island. They would hide in the forests and sabotage U.S. operations whenever an opportunity presented itself. Patrols often found themselves being ambushed out of nowhere as they let their guard down thinking the enemy threat had been dealt with. In fact, some Japanese soldiers never received word that the war had ended and continued fighting for many years after Japan surrendered and World War II was officially over. The loss of life and military assets during the Battle of Okinawa gave U.S. intelligence pause. If the Japanese were able to inflict such damage on a small piece of land hundreds of miles away from their main island, what would it cost Allied forces if they were to invade Japan itself? The loss of life would be unimaginable, 
and it was hypothesized that it would take years to finally subdue Japanese forces. If there was another way to force Japan into surrendering, the US needed to find it quickly. As the Battle of Okinawa raged on in the Pacific, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt died of an intercerebral hemorrhage in the brain on April 12, 1945. Harry Truman was sworn into office as the next President of the United States and immediately started making difficult decisions about the war in the Pacific. After word reached Truman that Okinawa had been secured at great cost, he tasked his advisors with finding a way to force Japan to surrender, and he wanted it done with minimal U.S. casualties. Unfortunately, at the time, there was no good option. It had become clear Emperor Hirohito would not submit willingly. In fact, everyone in Japan believed that they would win the war and were willing to lay down their lives to make sure it happened. Men, women, and children, military, civilian, elderly, all Japanese citizens would rather have died than surrender their country to a foreign power. This meant that regardless of what Truman decided to do, lives would be lost. The question was just how many people needed to die in order for World War II to come to a close. Soon after the transition of power from Roosevelt to Truman, the new president was made aware of a top-secret weapon that was being developed by scientists in Los Alamos, New Mexico. It was known as the Manhattan Project, named after the location of the team's first office in New York City, and would result in the world's first atomic bomb. After the successful test of the first nuclear bomb ever created on July 16, 1945, at Alamogordo bombing range, Truman believed that the atomic bomb could be his only way to force Japan into surrendering. Truman asked a committee of advisors led by the Secretary of War Henry Stimson to determine if using the atomic bomb on Japan was the best course of action to end the bloody war. After seeing the devastating effects of the nuclear explosion, the committee did not take this task lightly. They knew that if the U.S. detonated an atomic bomb on Japanese soil, the civilian casualties would be immense, but it was determined that an invasion of Japan would be even more costly for both sides. Most of the committee concluded that the bomb should be used. Stimson was a huge advocate that this was the right decision, so under the advisement of the committee, President Harry Truman issued the Potsdam Declaration on July 26, 1945, which called for the unconditional surrender of Japan. Truman warned that if the Japanese emperor did not comply, there would be prompt and utter destruction. There was no way that the Japanese leaders could have known what Truman was talking about as they had never seen a nuclear explosion before or even knew that such a bomb existed. This is one of the main problems with trying to justify using the atomic bomb. The Potsdam Declaration would have been outrageous to the Japanese emperor and his advisors. They knew that if the United States invaded their island, they could depend on the masses to fight until the very last person fell. The Japanese people would not give up their homeland to an invading enemy, and the Japanese leadership was pretty confident that they could cause enough casualties to the Allied forces that at the very worst they'd end up negotiating a truce. This would allow Japan to make a few demands of their own, such as maintaining control of the country. However, this was not an option for the Allied forces. They would not negotiate. It was either unconditional surrender by Japan or nothing. When Truman did not receive a reply from Emperor Hirohito, he gave the order to drop the bomb. On August 6, 1945, a Boeing B-29 called Enola Gay took off from an airfield on Tinian Island. In its cargo hold was Little Boy, the first atomic bomb ever to be used in a war. At 8.15 a.m., the Enola Gay spotted Hiroshima. The crew prepared to drop the bomb and get the hell out of Dodge before it detonated. The signal was given, red lights flashed as the bomb bay doors opened, Little Boy was dropped 31,000 feet above the city of Hiroshima. 44 seconds later, there was a bright flash as the atomic bomb detonated 1,500 feet before hitting the ground. Approximately 70,000 people were instantly incinerated by the blast. The Japanese finally found out what Truman meant by prompt and utter destruction. It's unclear what exactly was being discussed by the Japanese leadership immediately after the bomb was dropped, but when no declaration of surrender came, Three days after Hiroshima was bombed, the U.S. decided to try again. On August 9, 1945, a different B-29 named Boxcar carried a second larger atomic bomb named Fat Man toward Nagasaki. The bomb was dropped in the instant it detonated 40,000 more Japanese civilian and military personnel were consumed in the fiery blast. Both Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been wiped off the face of the planet by the atomic bombs. Japan was now ready to surrender. Talks between Japanese leadership and the United States began, and on September 2, 1945, Japan officially signed documents of surrender on board the USS Missouri. The question is, was the use of the atomic bomb justified by the United States? Was there another way to convince Japan to surrender? Or did tens of thousands of Japanese civilians need to die? We'll present you with evidence for both sides of the argument, but you will ultimately have to decide for yourself. You may be surprised at which side you choose. After the atomic bombs were dropped and the United States occupied Japan, some shocking information was discovered about Japan's plans for ending the war. According to Japanese military officers and soldiers, they knew where the U.S. invasion was going to land 
and had already begun preparing to inflict as much damage as possible to their forces. Their orders were to repel Allied forces for as long as possible and inflict casualties by any means necessary. Most of the Japanese military strategists knew that they would not be able to stop the invasion, but it was also known that the island's entire population would fight until they were all killed. Surrender was not an option for the Japanese people, and they believed that it was better to die fighting than to lose their homeland to the invading force. Knowing this, U.S. military leaders were convinced that they had made the right decision. There were over 70 million people who lived on the island, and it was predicted that everyone from children to grandmas would do their part to stop the invading Allied forces. This included makeshift kamikaze runs by civilians using grenades or other explosives. The carnage would have been unfathomable. Therefore, by detonating the atomic bombs, the military concluded that tens of thousands of U.S. soldiers' lives were saved along with millions of Japanese lives. Another argument to justify the use of the atomic bomb is that war itself is inhumane. The bombs dropped on Japan helped end World War II, and therefore it was the right call. To put it into perspective, in March of 1945, the United States dropped incendiary bombs on Tokyo. This caused massive fires to sweep across the city and consume everything in their path, including civilians. It's estimated that well over 100,000 people were killed in Tokyo bombings. So, was this any better than dropping an atomic bomb? Long-term effects of both situations are different. Over 1 million people lost their homes in the Tokyo bombing, but those who survived did not need to worry about radiation poisoning and cancer like the survivors of the atomic bomb blasts. A home can be rebuilt, but death by radiation cannot be avoided. It was also estimated by General MacArthur that even if the Japanese government was forced to surrender after the invasion, there would still be countless guerrilla groups that would hide in the forests and mountains on the island that would need to be dealt with. They would continuously wreak havoc on U.S. installations and oppose the new government that would be put in place. MacArthur concluded that it would take a million U.S. troops 10 years to deal with the rogue Japanese soldiers. At that point, the war might have been over on paper, but the battle would still continue for U.S. soldiers stationed in Japan. It's also important to note that many Japanese people still thought they could win the war even after the atomic bombs were dropped. The emperor himself needed to declare the war over, or the people of Japan would keep on fighting. The atomic bombs forced the Japanese leadership to concede and to tell their citizens they had lost the war and it was now time for peace. This led to several civilian and military groups taking up arms and revolting against their own government as they believed there should be no surrender. But these attempts to overthrow the government were put down by the Japanese military, and the unconditional surrender commenced. A less strong argument for using the atomic bomb, yet one that Harry Truman used after he left office, was that Japan started it. This might sound childish, but many Americans wanted revenge for what the Japanese did at Pearl Harbor. In 1958, the city council of Hiroshima passed a resolution condemning Truman for ordering the atomic bomb to be dropped on their city. Truman responded that he did not blame the council for condemning what he did, but he claimed the United States had been shot in the back, referencing the attack at Pearl Harbor. He concluded in his letter back to the council that the atomic bomb saved hundreds of thousands of American and Japanese lives, therefore it was justified. Some historians think that the American people would have forced Truman to use the atomic bomb even if he had decided not to initially. As more and more American soldiers died in the war and information about the successful test of a nuclear bomb in New Mexico got out, the public would have pressured Truman to use the new weapon of mass destruction or they would be happy to elect someone in the office who would. It's hotly debated whether demonstrating the capability of the atomic bomb by dropping it on an uninhabited piece of land for the Japanese to see would have been enough to cause them to surrender. Many scientists in Truman's initial committee of advisors believed that this show of force would indeed have been enough. However, the military personnel felt differently. The Japanese people were so invested in the war that merely demonstrating the atomic bomb's potential might have been seen as an empty threat. Therefore, it was concluded that the bomb must be dropped on a city that had military significance. The decision of which cities to bomb did not fall to Truman but to military leaders. Both Hiroshima and Nagasaki were chosen because they had military manufacturing facilities. However, this does beg the question. Why couldn't the bomb just have been dropped on a military facility away from any major cities? There were plenty of Japanese bases that were isolated from civilian populations. So why couldn't one of those have been the target? This question has also been debated over the decades without any clear answer as to why hitting a military base couldn't have been tried first. That brings us to an unsettling idea. Maybe dropping the atomic bombs on two Japanese cities was not justified. The main reason why many believe that dropping the atomic bombs was unethical is that the U.S. military intentionally targeted civilian populations. Many believe that the United States used terrorist-like tactics to force the Japanese government to surrender. Even current military ethics courses in the United States 
make justifying the dropping of atomic bombs difficult. When tough decisions need to be made during war and collateral damage is inevitable, the proportionality of benefit to cost needs to be weighted. It's agreed upon by many military officials and historians today that the destruction of military targets at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was nowhere near proportionate to the loss of civilian life. This makes dropping the bombs on these cities an unjustifiable choice. For people who think dropping the atomic bomb was necessary, but a military target should have been chosen, it's often cited that the bomb should have been dropped in the southern part of Kyushu. It was here where Japanese troops were massing to mount a defense against U.S. invasion. Not only would this have been a strategic significance, but it would have minimized the civilian casualties by targeting an area that was mostly filled with military personnel. And although some believe that dropping a demonstration bomb wouldn't have resulted in Japan surrendering, not everyone sees it this way. If the United States had detonated a bomb where high-ranking Japanese officers could see it, it's very plausible they would recommend to the emperor that peace talks should begin immediately. Also, if a demonstration didn't work, the next option still wouldn't have been to blow up a city full of civilians, as they could have tried dropping a bomb on a military base first. But the fact that the first target was a densely populated city where 70,000 people were obliterated by a single bomb seems like an extreme first choice when there were other more justifiable options. Many historians also believe that if a demonstration atomic bomb was used, the Emperor of Japan would have been willing to enter negotiations, although it's probable the US would have refused this option as they wanted Japan's unconditional surrender. But it's been argued that if the United States had been willing to negotiate, Japan would have come to the table after an atomic bomb demonstration. In fact, even without a demonstration, it's thought that most high-ranking officials in the military and government already knew the war was lost, so it's not out of the realm of possibility that if the United States had been willing to let Emperor Hirohito stay in power, Japan would have surrendered. This would have been possible without the mass murder of over 100,000 civilians by atomic bombs. But there was another factor that would have almost certainly led to the surrender of Japan. It had nothing to do with nuclear explosions or the United States. Instead, at the same time the US was dropping its second atom bomb, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan. There was no way that Japan could have defeated both the US and Allied forces in the Pacific as well as the Soviet Union advancing from the West. Japan knew this, and it's very plausible that if the United States had waited for the Soviet Union to declare war on Japan, they would have never had to drop the atomic bombs in the first place. Japan's plan at the time was to cause enough American losses that they would have been forced to negotiate a settlement. The average Japanese citizen and soldier might have believed that Japan could still win the war but the leadership was not under the same delusion. They were just weighing their options and trying to figure out the best outcome. However, once the Soviet Union declared war on Japan, it was only a matter of time before they became overwhelmed on multiple fronts. As soon as the Soviet Union joined the battle, they steamrolled their way through Japanese lines in Manchuria and pushed deeper and deeper into Japanese-controlled territories. Once this happened, Japan would have likely sought out a deal with the US, even if it hadn't dropped the atomic bombs. The reason for this is because Japan already knew that if the Soviets invaded, it would have been a very different type of occupation than if the United States was in charge. Japan likely already had information about the way that occupied territories in Europe were being treated by the Allies versus the Soviets. The Soviets did not have the best reputation. They tended to incorporate territories into the Soviet Union and then brutally strip them of their national identity. Knowing this, Japan might have seen the occupation by the United States as a better option if they were to surrender. And since the Soviets were closing in quickly, Japan might have reached out to the US and surrendered even if the atom bombs hadn't been dropped. And if this is the case, the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not justified at all. There is no doubt at the time that the majority of the American public believed using the atomic bomb was completely justified. In fact, a Gallup poll that was conducted almost immediately after the bombs were dropped in 1945 found that 85% of Americans approved of the decision. This is a huge amount of support, which might be why Truman felt pressure to give the order. It's important to remember that although Truman authorized the use of atomic weapons, a committee of military personnel made the decision of where to strike. In a Pew study conducted in the last several years, the sentiment of the American people has changed drastically about the use of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, only around 50% of the US citizens believe it was justified. There are probably several reasons for this. For one, many of the people who were alive during World War II and were impacted by Pearl Harbor are no longer with us. People who are further removed from such a tragic event tend to have less emotional investment and therefore might think more critically about a decision that cost the lives of over 100,000 civilians. We also now know much more about the long-term effects that nuclear weapons can have on people and the terrible diseases that can result from radiation poisoning. Many individuals don't think anything justifies killing so many civilians, even during a world war. This is especially true since there were other options besides dropping the atomic bomb 
bombs on heavily populated cities. There are arguments to be made for both sides of the atomic bomb debate, but there are a few undeniable facts. The United States targeted cities with civilians when they had the option of demonstrating the power of the atomic bomb on uninhabited land or against strictly military personnel. The Japanese were also probably willing to sit down for peace talks even without the bombs being dropped, especially after the Soviet Union declared war on them. All that being said, the atomic bombs definitely played a major role in forcing Japan to surrender and ending World War II. If the United States had invaded the main island of Japan, many more people would have died than perished as a result of the atomic bombs. And this does not necessarily justify the use of atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it does make you think if it was the best option in a really bad situation. It's 8.14 AM on August 6, 1945, and you're about to live through hell. But for now, a brilliant clear day is getting started. Morning traffic and crowded streetcars go by, and you arrive at work, a large modern office building. Earlier in the morning, there was an air raid alarm, but by now those are so common that they hardly register as more than routine. And besides, the all clear has come through. Only a few planes were spotted, meaning this likely wasn't a bombing run. There's no real reason to believe that this day would be any worse than the last. Other Japanese cities, notably Tokyo, have taken serious hits from bombing, but so far your city, Hiroshima, has been comparatively fortunate, all but ignored by the American B-29s. The total warfare Japan has been waging for over a decade has affected everyone in the country in some way. When you were younger, you'd served overseas yourself. Now, all these years later, it's almost surprising that you've been spared the worst tragedies of the home front. Most of all, you pray that the war will end before your son is old enough to fight, or daughter to be widowed. For now, like the other teenagers, they've been occupied with civilian defense, helping knock down old buildings to make way for military vehicles in the event of an invasion. A minute later, 8.15 AM, you step into the lobby of the building, and then the world changes. An incredible yellow light, like the flash from a camera, blazes all around you, and everything around you becomes empty white. You're sent flying and you feel pieces of debris strike you, followed by the deafening boom as the sound from the explosion catches up. You slam against the floor and lose consciousness, probably just for a moment, you're not sure. You know you need to get up. Did you break any bones? No time to consider the situation. No one else is in the lobby with you, but all of the furniture has been blown to one side of the room along with your body. You push yourself up and step back outside through the door that's now missing all of its glass. You check all around yourself and see what you're up against. In front of you is a wall of fire and it seems to be growing. You turn to run the other way, but now the wind is against you and the glass shards and pieces of rubble fly back toward the blaze in the most powerful storm you've ever felt. You duck back into the doorway and watch as anything that can catch fire does. Somehow, you'll have to fight the tremendous windstorm. As you push forward, you catch glimpses of people who's been outside during the blast, some lying dead in the street. The fingertips are the first part of the body to catch fire. Among the living, some are horribly burned. The boiling wind blows strips of clothing off them, along with strips of skin. Everyone just wants to get away from the fire. You feel like you might be getting burned yourself. There's the river in front of you. Along with the pack of people pressing against you, you jump into the water. When you rise above the surface to catch your breath, more debris rains down. How much time has passed? Are more bombs falling? You hear a child yelling and help her to get across to the other side of the river. There are no more bombs and although there are fires burning in all directions, the fireball has stopped expanding and the air isn't as hot. You try to help people to their feet. Some can manage, others can't. A fire engine arrives and the men start pulling anyone who can't walk onto the truck. You help as best you can and then follow in the direction that the truck heads along with a small cohort of other people who've escaped the worst of the blast. Now as you trek through piles of brick, concrete, and metal, making your way back toward your house, the cloud cover thickens and heavy drops of rain fall. They're black, apparently from soot. Nothing is as important to you as finding out if your family is safe, but neither you nor the other survivors can ignore the calls for help as you pass block upon block of leveled buildings amid the smoke and fire. For hours, as you press northward through the smoke and the wreckage and burning houses, you hear the cries of people trapped below buildings. When you can, you free them from the debris. Others, you're powerless to help. You pass countless stumbling, crawling, prostrate, or dead. You bury your guilt and try not to see the worst. 
You press forward in what you're fairly sure is the direction of your neighborhood. A little girl is wandering, clutching at a wound on her head. You refuse to pass her by and for a mile you carry her, until you reach a makeshift clinic inside a school that, aside from its windows, is largely intact. Later you'll learn that you were among the closest people to the atomic blast who didn't die. The building you were in shielded you from the full force of the blast and heat. Anyone within a half a mile who was exposed to the initial blast of heat didn't merely burn to death, they were instantly incinerated. Outside of that radius, thousands more burned to death or died from the flying debris and falling buildings. Here in the elementary school, people are already stretched out shoulder to shoulder on the floor. A few nurses scramble from person to person, cleaning the worst wounds, but apparently already without enough bandages for everyone. Some of the charred bodies have clearly already stopped breathing. All of the emergency planning in the city, setting up emergency aid centers with supplies in the various sectors of the city, had assumed that there would actually be a city left after an attack. Most of the adults are stoical in their suffering, but from the cries of children it's clear that there's little medicine for the pain. As you scan the unbelievable ranks of bodies on the mats, desperately hoping not to see anyone familiar, you see the full extent of their injuries. Many are so badly burned, you can't imagine that they'll survive. Apparently, people who were wearing dark colored clothing were sometimes burned more than those wearing white because of the difference in heat absorption. With uncontrollable tears of relief, you learn that no one in your family is among them. Three miles from the city center, your family's wooden house was destroyed, but it hadn't caught fire, at least not yet. You're frightened when you realize that your wife has been bleeding, cut down her back and sides by glass shards, but she assures you that the injuries are all on the surface and takes you by the hand to your son and daughter, both of whom are trying to administer some aid to the wounded. There's no actual ointment left and they're making do with cooking oil which is better than nothing, albeit disturbing given what's happened. They've both suffered bruises and cuts, but their greatest pain was waiting for you to return. They'd been certain that since you were in the city center, you must have been killed. For your part, you're glad you're able to keep your children healthy as they've grown up. Other young people at the clinic have become weak as the rationing has gotten worse. And you can see that among the injured, malnutrition is going to make the chances of survival much less likely. Now that you've found your family, you can go back out and help with the rescue. You can't see much organized effort beyond the continuing lines of evacuees, but along with other individuals, you try to move as many of the injured as you can. Some wounded people are stuck on a sandbar by the river, and you help to lift them to higher ground before the tide rises. In one particularly gruesome instance, the body of a victim slips from your hands as the burned skin of the arm tears loose. After several more hours you begin feeling weak and wander back to the aid station. By the time you get there, you realize that broken bones or no, you haven't escaped unharmed. It can't just be exhaustion catching up with you. You're lightheaded and feel weak, like you've come down with the flu. You sit down on a cot just to catch your breath. You feel feverish. A nurse offers a cup of water, which you gratefully accept. But as you pour the cool liquid past your lips, you can't swallow it. Embarrassed, you cough and spit it out. You feel much worse all of a sudden and without hesitation begin to vomit on the floor. Someone puts a wastebasket next to you to catch it. You aren't the first with this symptom, nor will you be alone as you continue to retch and suffer diarrhea for days on end. Aid workers are distributing soft rice biscuits and bowls of rice porridge, but like you, many people have little appetite. As days pass, insects find the necrotic tissue on the survivors. Horrid family members do their best to clear the wounds of larvae. You're embarrassed to have your wife and child caring for you. It's supposed to be the other way around. After a couple days of misery, the nausea subsides. How could it not? You haven't eaten in days. It takes courage, but you're able to take tiny sips of water and then a bite or two of porridge. It's rare to get a moment with a doctor, but from what you can overhear, you've been hit with sickness caused by an invisible kind of force called gamma rays that can fly right through your body ripping tissues apart. As your strength recovers, you again try to make yourself useful, aiding in the endless recovery work. Often, that means helping to carry bodies to the perpetual funeral pyres. Many of these unfortunates never got to say goodbye to their families and their loved ones will never know what became of their remains. For some victims, the poisoning from radiation was much worse. By the 24-hour mark, several had become incoherent from damage to the brain. Others had a racing heart. Some soon suffered a heart attack. Some literally changed color, turning bright red as if sunburned. Those who 
unlike you never recovered their appetite, were dead in a few days. But then something especially worrying begins. Several people who had been up and about are now again lying flat down on the cots, and they don't look good. Their skin has become mottled with purple blotches as blood vessels break. Again, they feel weak and sick. The pain already looks like too much to bear, but then it gets worse. The dying vomit blood and the blood flows from their anus. Even the eyes begin to bleed. By now, additional medical workers have come from the outskirts and outside the prefecture, but those who hover over death tend to have shriveled veins so they can't even receive morphine. You hope that you're not due to follow their downward slide. A doctor examines you and notices spots on your body that you'd overlooked. It's happening. But at least for now you don't feel it, and you're able to carry on a conversation. The doctor has come from Tokyo. He must be an expert on this kind of disease, although before the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there were very few cases, mostly scientists doing research with radium or other unusual substances. He confirms that the atomic bomb blast dosed you with harmful radiation. In that conversation and many more that would follow over the years, you avidly learn details about radiation. The blast did emit gamma rays and x-rays as well. They're slightly different, but the main thing to know is that in a high enough strength, they're both very bad for you, unlike the relatively weak x-rays that doctors use to take pictures of your bones. Both x-rays and gamma rays are made of photons, the same kind of wave particle as a regular beam of light. But they have much shorter wavelength and very different properties from visible light as far as people are concerned. By comparison, some of the people who are recovering from serious burns to the skin also received a very, very heavy amount of long wavelength infrared radiation, which causes matter to heat up, in this case a great deal. The temperature of the blast was thousands of degrees, enough to reduce people to dust in an instant. Although gamma rays don't cause surface burns, they're an example of what's called ionizing radiation. Non-ionizing radiation, like the signals that a radio antenna picks up, doesn't seem to have much of an effect on living tissue at everyday doses. But ionizing radiation is another story. This class gets its name from its invisible effect, which is to cause an atom to lose electrons, leaving positively charged ions. Inside the cells of your body are complex molecules held together by electrons, and if enough of the molecules are torn apart, the cell dies. This is especially bad when it happens in bone marrow, which manufactures blood cells for the body. A deficiency of red blood cells deprives the body of oxygen. Low white blood cell count leaves the body vulnerable to infection, and too few platelets prevents blood from clotting, which causes the characteristic blotches in addition to other ill effects. In addition to gamma and X-rays, there are streams of particles called beta rays, which are loose electrons, alpha rays, the charged nuclei of helium atoms, and loose neutrons, flying out of unstable elements as they decay. A few pounds of one such element, uranium, was the fuel for the atom bomb at Hiroshima. Another, plutonium, powered the blast at Nagasaki. Both elements proved terribly effective at creating a chain reaction. Moreover, it's not safe to even handle much of these substances for any length of time without protection. Marie Curie, who had discovered many of the important properties of radioactivity, had herself later died of radiation poisoning. So amid the smoke and dust from the nuclear explosion was a mass of radioactive particles blasted into the air. Some of that material fell right back down in the black rain. If you have radioactive material on your skin or clothes, you can spread it around. Worse, if you ingest radioactive dust, it can stay in your system for some time and for a while at least, your body could itself give off radiation. You think about how you held your wife and children and now wish you hadn't found them so quickly. Because the blast was so far above ground, there wouldn't be a dangerous concentration at the center, one small comfort in the chaos. For weeks, you do decline in health. You're admitted to a real hospital this time. All your hair falls out and your skin becomes swollen. The nausea comes back. People continue to die. By September, some of the burn victims are in better shape. You assume that those with both heavy burns and radiation poisoning are dead by now. But you do not die. Over the years, your family builds a new life, utterly thankful that you didn't share the fate of more than 200,000 in the two devastated cities. You return to work for some time and then retire on a pension. Your son and daughter both marry, and each begins to build their own family. You learn about a special kind of chemical in the body called DNA, which scientists have found contains all the blueprints for the cells in your body, 
and that combines with the DNA from your spouse to build a new person in a woman's womb. You also learn that it's damage to DNA that causes cancer, and you know that cancer rates are especially high for people exposed to radiation. You're not worried so much for yourself as for your children. Although they may not have displayed acute radiation sickness, they were certainly exposed to gamma rays. And if DNA is damaged, might their children not have inherited the mutated genes? Certainly, some babies born soon after the bombing had high rates of birth defects, like underdeveloped brains. So far, no one has seen any evidence of genetic damage passed on to the children of Hibakusha, atomic bomb survivors, who weren't exposed in utero. You make sure that your children and theirs get checkups from the doctor. And the new, more peaceful Japanese government is keeping tabs on their health, and yours, of course. You can't help but notice people in your new neighborhood in Tokyo don't want to stand close to anyone in your family, and although their fears are unfounded, you can understand their wariness in such strange times. And you follow the arms race as nations build nuclear weapons that could somehow inflict far more damage than the one you experienced. Years later, you take your grandchildren to see a movie you've heard about. In this movie, there's a reptile whose body is altered by radiation, turning it into a monster that destroys the city of Tokyo. It's a bit of dramatic license, you know, but that's what movies are for. The kids are old enough that they try not to seem scared, although clearly the fire-breathing beast makes quite an impression on them. The allegory in the movie is not lost on you, although you decide not to share it with these children of a new era. They're aware of their country's bitter, foolish experience in making war, and the awful toll that their parents witnessed when men tested the limits of human suffering. But you hope, with all your heart, that they will themselves only ever see such horror in a movie. This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. Get two months of Skillshare free and learn new skills by using the link in the description. The word bomb comes from the Latin word bombus, meaning something that booms. It's thought it was the Chinese that created the first ever bombs with explosives inside a harder metal shell way back in the 13th century. But these powerful explosives will be remembered mostly for causing havoc during the Second World War when Germany and Britain were butting heads in their respective aerial bombing campaigns. The Unabomber made small explosives that would explode upon opening a package and terrorists leave them at the side of roads. But there are bombs so powerful that we don't even want to use them. And that's what we'll explore today in this episode of the Infographic Show, Atomic Bomb vs. Hydrogen Bomb, How Do They Compare? We'll start with the atomic bomb. You might have heard of this kind of bomb and have probably seen pictures of the devastation it can cause. This is the type of bomb that was dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 by the Americans. Make no mistake, the British were behind this plan and also very much involved in the process. It's said around 80,000 people died instantly in Hiroshima after the bomb, known as Little Boy, was dropped and more than double that died in total, mostly due to radiation. In Nagasaki, the bomb, nicknamed Fat Man, instantly killed around 70,000 people. So, how did scientists create something so deadly? Well, you see, scientists for a while had known that you could potentially create a huge amount of energy from little matter. Albert Einstein knew that, but it wasn't he that created the atomic bomb. Apparently, the Germans thought this was possible, but the British had already formed a committee and published something called the British Maud Report, which detailed the feasibility of creating an atomic bomb. The scientists wrote that it was possible to create massive amounts of TNT from a small ball of uranium-235. A report called Use of Uranium for a Bomb was written, which was given by the British to the USA. Soviet spies also got their hands on the report. This is how it all began. The Americans invested lots of money in actually creating this bomb, and that was under the aegis of the government's Manhattan Project. Many people took part in this, including military engineers, MIT scientists, the company DuPont, and a couple of ACE physicists called J. Robert Oppenheimer and Enrico Fermi. So what did they discover over at the Manhattan Project? They found that they could create a massive explosion by what in layman's terms became known as splitting the atom. This is known as nuclear fission. Today you should remember two words, fission, splitting something, and fusion, joining something. As for nuclear fission, one anti-nuclear website describes it like this. The nucleus of an atom is split into two smaller fragments by a neutron. This method usually involves isotopes of uranium or plutonium. Neutrons split from the nucleus and energy is released and then these neutrons hit other uranium or plutonium nuclei and they also split, 
further yielding more energy and more and more neutrons. This produces a powerful and instantaneous chain reaction that can produce something like 15 kilotons and 20 kilotons of TNT. It sounds simple, eh? But as you know, few countries are capable of doing it. Those include the United States, Russia, the United Kingdom, China, France, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. It's hard because first you need your material, which includes weapons-grade uranium. As you've seen in the movies, getting your hands on this stuff is not easy. Besides that, you then need scientists clever enough to understand the process of making a bomb, and you also need to spend tons of money on missiles that can carry the thing. So, let's say someone has gotten hold of this weapons-grade uranium, can they make a bomb? Live science tells us that to create this chain reaction we just talked about, scientists have to create something called a supercritical mass to hold the atoms. It's this state that allows the chain reaction to happen. A supercritical mass is formed in a uranium bomb by initially storing the fuel as separate subcritical masses to prevent the bomb from detonating too early and then joining the two masses together, said Live Science. It's also difficult to make the bomb in a way that will allow this chain reaction to take place before the energy causes it to fail. This tricky process, and the fact that getting the raw materials is so hard, is the reason so few countries have these things. Now you're thinking, they haven't even answered the question yet. Well, we kind of did before, when we told you the definition of the word fusion. A hydrogen bomb is not a fission bomb, but a fusion bomb. And besides the difference in how the H-bomb is made, another difference is that it is much more powerful. Time Magazine tells us the H-bomb could potentially be a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb. A scientist told Time Magazine that to make one of these, you need to first master the atomic bomb. To make it, using a simple recipe formula, you still need that uranium or some plutonium, you then throw in some deuterium and tritium, which are isotopes of hydrogen, and the magic happens when you fuse atoms together rather than split them. You need really high temperatures to cause this fusion, and that's where you get the name thermonuclear bomb. Voila! Mankind's piece de resistance in the age of possible annihilation. It's said they are even harder to make, but lighter, so they can travel more easily on the back of a missile. Thankfully, no one has dropped one of these on people but the USA and Russia both tested these mega bombs in the 1950s. This was shortly after two scientists in the US, Edward Teller and Stanislav Ulam, created it. It's also believed that Britain, Russia, China, and France have conducted hydrogen bomb tests, and the jury is still out on North Korea. If you want to know what happened immediately after the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Life magazine reported it in 1945 like this. In the following waves, people's bodies were terribly squeezed then their internal organs ruptured, then the blast blew the broken bodies at 500 to 1,000 miles per hour through the flaming, rubble-filled air. Practically everyone within a radius of 6,500 feet was killed. After hearing that, imagine what an H-bomb could do if it's a thousand times more powerful. The website NukeMap believes that if such a bomb was dropped on New York, right on top of New York City Hall, it would result in 385,660 deaths and 632,540 injuries from the blast alone. Fires would burn, everything would be destroyed around the blast site, with destruction reaching as far as New Jersey. Radiation would then get to work, and NukeMap believes the death toll would be about 792,630. Imagine bombs were dropped on lots of American cities, and you have a fallout that would affect much of the country. Well, we'll leave you with that sobering thought. Hitler's war machine continues to devastate Europe. The Allies have to contend with super weapons concocted by the minds of Nazi scientists and engineers. But one threat looms greater than all the rest, a nuclear bomb. The Allies have been working toward creating an atomic bomb for several years now, hoping to beat the Nazis to the punch. But as World War II rages on, no one is quite sure how close Hitler and the Nazi regime are to weaponizing nuclear energy. One thing is for sure. If Hitler has access to the power of the atom, he will use it to bring the world to its knees. This cannot be allowed. To stop the Nazi bomb, the Allies send soldiers on secret missions to find out how close the Nazis are to an atomic bomb. Their mission is to gather and analyze intel on the Nazi nuclear program. If the Nazis are close to creating an atomic bomb, they must find ways to slow them down. If they've succeeded, then they must be stopped before the bomb can be used. Reconnaissance gathered at the beginning of the war shows that the Germans started researching nuclear power under the name Uranium Project. It began shortly after the German invasion of Poland in September of 1939. 
This is unwelcome news because it means the Nazis have been working with nuclear energy for several years. The German Army Ordnance started the program by putting physicist Kurt Diebner in charge to investigate the military applications of fission, who was aware that when an atom is split apart, huge amounts of energy are released. Who knew something so small could be so powerful? What will scientists think of next? Diebner is working with another physicist whose name is Werner Heisenberg. Communications between the two Nazi scientists had been intercepted, revealing that Heisenberg has calculated that using nuclear fission to create a chain reaction may be the Nazis' path to producing a nuclear explosion. It would seem that the Nazis understand the basic principles of an atomic bomb, and Hitler might be closer to completing an atomic bomb than anyone originally thought. It is clear that Nazi scientists have figured out the basic principles of fission but have not yet been able to weaponize atomic energy. However, information from a Norwegian scientist who escapes Nazi-occupied Norway provides vital information on the path the Nazis are planning to take to create their nuclear bomb. The scientists had worked at a facility that specializes in creating heavy water. Heavy water is a water molecule that has hydrogen atoms with a neutron in their nucleus. This is very rare but gives the hydrogen atoms more mass, making the water molecule itself heavier. This special form of hydrogen is vital to the Nazi nuclear program because it can be used to create the chain reaction needed for a nuclear explosion. If the Nazis are allowed to continue using the heavy water facility, they'll eventually be able to create an atomic bomb. A mission must be organized to shut down the facility. Allied command is informed of the role the heavy water facility plays in Hitler's nuclear program, and a secret mission called Operation Gunnerside is organized. The chemists who worked at the heavy water facility in Vemork, 100 miles outside of Oslo, volunteered to spearhead the mission. They already have a working knowledge of the facility and will be able to infiltrate and disrupt the Nazi operations. They are trained in Scotland and put through rigorous physical and mental tests. By the end of their short training regimen, they have the basic skills of a special forces unit. The leader of the squad is Leif Tronstadt. He's nicknamed the Mailman by his comrades. Tronstadt was a professor of chemistry before the war started. When the Germans invaded Norway, he enlisted and fought to protect his country. Norway lost and became one of the many European countries occupied by the Nazis. Tronstadt joined the underground and provided the Allies with intelligence on what the Nazis were using the heavy water for at the Venmark facility. He escaped Norway and went to England to relay all the information he had gathered. Once in England, he only wanted one thing to be sent back to Norway with a squad of soldiers to disrupt the Nazis' plans. The intelligence that Tronstadt provides informs the Allies that they cannot just bomb the facility. All of the vital equipment is deep underground, and even if the plant is bombed, operations most likely can resume with minor adjustments. Also, innocent Norwegian civilians are working at the heavy water facility and will be killed in a bombing raid. The Allies know they need boots on the ground. The Norwegian scientists under the command of Tronstadt are assigned the job of killing Nazis and disrupting their plans for the heavy water facility. After receiving their training on sabotage and stealth warfare from a top-secret British unit called the Special Operations Executive, the Norwegian unit is ready for their mission. They are flown to Norway and airdropped outside of Vemork. The Norwegian squad knows that the facility is already a natural fortress. It can only be accessed by a single-lane suspension bridge and is surrounded by mountains. Legend has it that the air grows cold so fast that it can freeze the flames of a fire. The Norwegian squad buckles in for the coldest few weeks of their lives. The scientists turned soldiers spend days skiing through the snow to collect more intel on the operations at the facility. They were all born and raised in Norway, so they grew up in similar harsh environments. They used their new training and long-time knowledge to carefully make their way through forests and across mountains. However, the natural topography is not the only thing the Norwegian squad has to worry about. The Nazis have surrounded the facility with minefields, searchlights, barbed wire, and patrols. It seems that the heavy water factory is now a Nazi fortress, but the mission has to succeed. The Nazis might be close to creating a nuclear weapon, and the disruption of their heavy water facility could slow them down. After days in the harsh environment, the squad decides there's only one way into the Nazi fortress. They must climb down the steep rock cliff that the heavy water facility sits against. They slowly rappel down the icy rock wall, supporting one another in case someone slips. It's treacherous, but the squad makes it down without any mishaps. They infiltrate the facility through one of the rarely used back doors, being sure not to trip any alarms. The Norwegian squad sets explosives at key points around the facility. They sneak through winding concrete hallways, always making sure they're one step ahead of the Nazis. The squad escapes out of the facility and moves to a safe distance. Then they wait and watch. 
The explosives go off, causing fires to erupt all over the facility. The machinery is damaged and it'll take months to repair. They successfully disrupted Hitler's ability to make heavy water, and the Allies can breathe a sigh of relief that the Nazis will not be able to create any more heavy water for nuclear weapons in the near future. But what if they already have stored up enough heavy water to make an atomic bomb? Is it possible the Nazis already have everything they need for nuclear warfare? The Allies need to make sure that Hitler does not already have a stockpile of atomic bombs hidden somewhere. It's time to move on to the next mission. Further intel from Allied soldiers suggests there might be an operational nuclear reactor somewhere in Germany. This cannot be confirmed, but nothing can be left to chance. The Allies are making great progress across the world. The United States has even completed the testing of their nuclear bombs, and the devastation it causes is immense. If Hitler has his own atomic bomb, he might turn Europe into a radioactive wasteland. Allied forces are advancing on Berlin. It seems that Hitler is backed into a corner, but that's when a wild animal is the most dangerous. Intel comes in that scientists working under Diebner have built and tested a nuclear device. The Germans are doing everything in their power to try and turn the war around. Allied Command puts together a secret mission to kidnap Hitler's main scientists. If successful, the mission will end the possibility of a Nazi nuclear bomb once and for all. A covert special ops unit is formed, codenamed the Alsos Mission and nicknamed Lightning A. The team is led by Colonel Boris Pash. Pash was the counterintelligence officer in charge of security for America's nuclear weapons program. Pash and Lightning A follow the Allied troops to the front lines. They interrogate any scientists that are captured along the way for more information about the Nazi nuclear program. It seems that scientists do not have a nuclear bomb yet, but the Allies need to be sure so Pash's team presses forward with the rest of the advancing Allied troops. Lightning A is about to embark on their most dangerous mission. Pash and Lightning A push past the advancing Allied forces. They are now operating on their own behind enemy lines. The advance forward was not moving fast enough for Lightning A's mission. Unfortunately, the special force has to deal with some of the toughest Nazi soldiers still left in the war, the Werwolf. This is the name given to the bands of die-hard Nazi youth. They will not give up, and they're waiting to kill any allies that cross their paths. Pash and Lightning A reach Heidelberg, where they come across a large Nazi force. Things can go really bad, really fast, if they're not careful. But the Nazi soldiers believe the war is almost over and surrender to Lightning A. The Nazis are interrogated for information on the whereabouts of the remaining nuclear scientists. The information that is uncovered leads Lightning A to a secret Nazi nuclear lab hidden in a cave. The lab contains a test nuclear reactor. It is disassembled immediately. The problem now is that the Nazi scientists have been tipped off about the Allies' special mission, and they're on the run. The fact that there's a test reactor in a cave is not a good sign. Pash and Lightning A need to capture the rogue scientist to ensure Hitler does not have nuclear capabilities. Lightning A pushes further into enemy territory and continues to uncover clues about the Nazi nuclear program. A nuclear research facility is found, hidden in a textile mill with laboratories in the surrounding buildings. They've finally stumbled upon what they're looking for. Lightning A captures 25 scientists. Through intense interrogation, the Nazis reveal the location of hidden research files. They've been stored in a watertight drum and sunk into a cesspool. Those Nazi bastards are not making things easy for Pash and Lightning A. Members of the squad have to dig through feces, but eventually locate the drum with all of the notes and research in it. The Nazis have conducted a lot of research around nuclear weapons, and Pash is nervous that Hitler might be preparing for one last push using nuclear weapons. Lightning A needs to find one of the men who started the Nazi nuclear research program, a man who has more knowledge than practically anyone else about Nazi nuclear capabilities. Pash needs to find Heisenberg. Intel has uncovered that Heisenberg is hidden in the Bavarian Alps. Pash takes Lightning A to track him down. The squad is attacked again and again by Werwolf Youngs. They engage in guerrilla warfare across the Alps, all to find one Nazi scientist. Due to all of the fighting, Lightning A has been reduced to 20 men, but they're close to their goal. Lightning A reaches the town of Erfeld, where they encounter approximately 700 SS troops. Pash uses his cunning and a little lying to convince the commanders of the Nazi soldiers that he has a lot more men than just 20 worn down soldiers. The Nazis decide to surrender instead of fight. The commanders eventually give up the location of Heisenberg, who is hiding in a mountain cabin not far away. Lightning A captures the scientist two days before Hitler commits suicide. After questioning Heisenberg, it's clear Hitler never had and was never really close to having nuclear weapons. It is a great relief that the Nazis never developed nuclear weapons. The war may have gone very differently if they had, but why didn't they? 
Hitler undeniably had the resources and scientists to make an atomic bomb a reality. The main reason, it seems, is because Hitler never really put the energy or effort into developing his nuclear program. He had been so successful with his troops, tanks, and aircraft that he didn't see any reason to pump money into developing an atomic bomb until it was too late. Toward the end, he began to realize a nuclear weapon could turn the tide of the war back in his favor, but it was already too late. Another issue is that the Nazi nuclear program was divided into different camps. There were several different scientists working on nuclear fission, but they seemed to be more in competition than working together. This is one of the reasons the United States developed nuclear weapons first. The US consolidated all research into one project, the Manhattan Project, so all scientists were working together collaboratively. Now the Second World War is over and there's no longer any need to worry about Hitler and his crazy idea for a Third Reich. The world is safe from the threat of nuclear devastation and everyone can sleep safely at night. There's just one little problem. The Cold War is about to begin. August 6, 1945, 7.15 a.m., 60 minutes before the atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. The skies are clear over southern Japan. Colonel Paul Tibbetts Jr. pilots the Enola Gay toward a target blissfully unaware of the catastrophe about to be unleashed over their heads. The crew of the modified B-29 is silent as they prepare to drop a bomb that promises to create the most powerful explosion ever used in war. We're approaching the target, Tibbetts says, arm the weapon. In the cargo hold of the Enola Gay, Captain William Parsons prepares the atomic bomb for drop. Right after the takeoff, he put the final piece of the little boy bomb together. Now he checks one last time to make sure the device detonates at the appropriate altitude. A bead of sweat trickles down the side of his face. Even though what he's doing is relatively safe, there's still a thought that one wrong move could make the B-29 ground zero for an atomic explosion. Tibbetts pulls up on the flight stick and ascends to an altitude of 31,000 feet. The higher he can get the plane, the more time he'll have to evacuate the area before the bomb reaches the detonation altitude. He waits for the all-clear from the two B-29s that have accompanied the Enola Gay on the mission for reconnaissance. One of the aircraft is scouting over the primary target of Hiroshima, the other is conducting surveillance over the secondary targets of Kokura and Nagasaki. The radio aboard the Enola Gay crackles as the signal comes in. Whether of the primary target is all clear, proceed to primary target. Colonel Tibbetts adjusts his heading ever so slightly and continues toward Hiroshima. 8 a.m., 15 minutes before the atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. Colonel Tibbetts speaks to the crew. Target is in sight, prepare to drop the bomb. The 12 men on the aircraft say their final prayers and think about their loved ones. This is the first time an atomic bomb has been dropped from a plane. It's unclear if the bomb will work properly or if there will be enough time to get the Enola Gay out of the blast zone before detonation. This may very well be the last time any of the crew will have the luxury of reminiscing about their families and friends. Tibbetts maneuvers the aircraft into striking position. 8.12 a.m., two minutes before the atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. I'm transferring command to you, Farabee, Tippett says over his headset. Major Thomas Farabee, the Enola Gay's bombardier, sits at the front of the aircraft. He can see the city of Hiroshima below through the glass of the plane's nose. From the pedestal gun sighting station, Farabee shouts out slight adjustments that need to be made to the aircraft's trajectory. Tibbetts makes the modifications as Farabee calls them out. He takes a deep breath and lets it out slowly. A moment later, the bombing run begins. Farabee has the IOE bridge lined up perfectly. This is the precise target for the drop. Everyone put on your protective goggles, Tibbetts says over the radio. Farabee looks through the viewfinder one last time before donning his headgear and preparing to drop the atomic bomb. 8.15 a.m. The atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. Bombs away, Farabee yells into his headset. The bomb bay doors open and the little boy atomic bomb plummets toward the ground. Tibbetts immediately banks hard into a turn. He pushes the engines of the Enola Gay to their limit. They roar under the strain of the extra thrust. The entire fuselage creaks as the plane rapidly turns away. It's a race against time. Every second that ticks by brings the explosion of the atomic energy closer and closer. Tibbetts grits his teeth, willing the Enola Gay to move faster. 30 seconds to detonation. The plane's engines grow red from burning at full power. The crew braces themselves. 15 seconds to detonation. Sergeant Bob Karen, the Enola Gay's tail gunner, squints through his goggles. He'll be the only member of the crew able to see the initial blast as the bomb goes off. This is not an honor Karen is sure he wants. Three, two, one. There's a bright flash of light. Karen shields his face with his forearm. His eyes are closed, but when he opens them, he can hardly believe what he sees. It's like a peep into hell, Karen says over the radio. There's a somber silence. January 6, 1939, six years before the atomic bomb is dropped on Japan. Lisa Meitner and Otto Frisch, two Jewish scientists fleeing Nazi Germany, have been following a discovery made by two scientists named 
Irene Joliot-Curie and Pavle Savic working out of France. They have determined that by bombarding uranium with neutrons, a transformation can take place that has the potential to release huge amounts of energy. Meitner and Frisch are desperate to make it to Copenhagen before another great war breaks out, both to save their lives and share what they've learned with the other scientists. It is in Denmark that they meet with a brilliant physicist by the name of Niels Bohr. Bohr is about to leave for the United States and is excited to share the new discovery brought to his attention by Meitner and Frisch with the scientists there. He discusses the transformation and the resulting release of energy with Albert Einstein and other scientists in the US. After their meeting, the group of researchers announces their findings. It is determined that by striking uranium-235 or plutonium-239 atoms with neutrons, the nucleus can be split into fragments resulting in a huge burst of energy. This process has been termed fission by Meitner and Frisch and lays the foundation for what would one day become the atom bomb. June 1940, five years before the atomic bomb is dropped on Japan. When fission occurs, there's a chance that neutrons are released and a sustained chain reaction will happen, Enrico Fermi says to Niels Bohr as they smoke pipes in a university classroom. The two scientists are working on the equations necessary to harness nuclear energy and change the world. If that's true, Bohr replies, this process might be more powerful than what we could have ever imagined. Scientists in the United States continue to work on the prospect of atomic energy. Slowly, the secrets of the atom and the process of fission become clearer. By the end of the month, the basic facts about nuclear energy are known by most scientists around the world. The race to harness the power of the atom has begun. December 1941, four years before the atomic bomb is dropped on Japan. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by the naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addresses Congress and the people of the United States. The attack on Pearl Harbor thrust the U.S. into World War II. This single event will lead to millions of lives lost during the war in the Pacific. The conflict will end with two Japanese cities being decimated and the area around them covered in radioactive fallout for years to come. September 1942 three years before the atomic bomb is dropped on Japan. General Leslie R. Groves is placed in charge of the Manhattan Project, named after the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Manhattan District, based at Columbia University. The atomic program spans the country, but the Manhattan Project has stuck as a codename for the top secret project, as it's where it all began. For a while now, a scientist by the name of J. Robert Oppenheimer has been deeply involved in the efforts to develop the atomic bomb. General Groves has taken note of Oppenheimer's enthusiasm. How would you like to lead the team of scientists working on the bomb?" Groves asks. Oppenheimer pauses for a moment to think about what this could mean. He's been working tirelessly to help the government achieve its goals and further the scientific understanding necessary to achieve a working atomic bomb. What the general is offering him would change everything. He would be directly responsible for the success of the project. It would be an honor, General, Oppenheimer says as he shakes Groves' hand. In the coming years, Oppenheimer will lead the team that creates a weapon which could literally end the world. December 2, 1942. Everyone stand back and be prepared to shut it down if something goes wrong, Enrico Fermi says to his team. They stand on the platform looking down on the squash court. The court sits under the bleachers of Stagg Field at the University of Chicago. On the court itself is Chicago pile number one. Do we think it's wise to initiate a nuclear reaction under the football field? One of the researchers asks. Everyone pauses. This is for science, for the United States, and for the future of humanity," one of the physicists sitting at the control panel says. There's an agreement. The switch is flipped. The reactor begins to hum. Neutrons begin bombarding the fuel rods in the reactor. A self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction begins with Chicago pile number one. Atomic energy is released, plutonium is created, and all the theoretical science done up to this point around atomic energy has been experimentally proven. A scientist takes one of the rods out of the reactor. He runs a Geiger counter over it. The machine rapidly begins to click. It's clear that a huge amount of radiation has been generated, but the ramifications of this byproduct are not yet known. January 1943, two years and eight months before the atomic bomb is dropped on Japan. General Grove smiles as he reads progress reports sent by Oppenheimer. They're getting close, really close. The government has chosen a 580 square mile parcel of land in Washington state to generate the plutonium needed to construct an arsenal of atomic bombs. The only problem is there are people living on the land that Groves wants. However, this is an easy fix. He's backed by the United States government and at this point, he's been given the go-ahead to do whatever it takes to make the bomb. The local population of Hanford, Richland, and White Bluffs are ordered to vacate their homes. They have 90 days to do so or the military will be sent in to encourage them to make the right choice. Groves won't let a few holdouts stop him and the Manhattan Project. 
from getting the resources they need to complete the bomb. Along with the entire populations of these towns, the Winapam Native Americans are forced to relocate. They're sent to Priest Rapids and lose access to their ancestral fishing grounds along the Columbia River. This is just another egregious mistreatment of people who are native to this land by the United States government. The U.S. government suppresses as many outcries as they need to in order to complete the construction of their facility. This is a matter of national security that the Hanford Engineer Works be built to supply the military with plutonium. To Groves and the other high-ranking officials that are aware of the Manhattan Project, a few thousand unhappy citizens and Native Americans is a small price to pay for the fate of the entire world. April 1943, two years and four months before the atomic bomb is dropped on Japan. Oppenheimer sifts through several different maps looking for the perfect locations to carry out the first test of an atomic bomb. The Hanford facility is remote, but not as remote as he would like. Using fission to create an atomic blast has never been done before, and it's not clear exactly how destructive the explosion will be. According to some calculations, there is a very small chance that the atomic blast could ignite the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere and cause the entire planet to become a raging inferno. But Oppenheimer and his team on the Manhattan Project are almost positive that it won't happen. The risk of possibly destroying the planet is outweighed by their thirst for knowledge and the ability to wipe their enemies off the face of the Earth. That's the spot, Oppenheimer says, pointing to a map of New Mexico with his index finger. He's chosen a remote region in the Los Alamos Mesa. It's 34 miles south of Santa Fe and in the middle of the desert. This should be isolated enough to conduct the necessary tests without anyone finding out what they're doing. Engineers begin arriving at the newly dubbed Los Alamos Laboratory. The first task is to create a bomb that can hold the appropriate amount of fissionable material and to be dropped from a plane, and has a fuse that will detonate at the appropriate altitude. This all needs to be done before the team can ramp up its stores of fissionable material. If they don't have a delivery method, there's no point in reducing the fissionable products being sent to New Mexico from other plants such as the Hanford Engineer Works into pure metal. Every week, more and more scientists, engineers, and technicians arrive at Los Alamos. By the time of the first test, there will be around 5,000 people at the site. April 12, 1945, four months before the atomic bomb is dropped on Japan. The nation mourns. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt has just passed away. Many are in shock. In the president's last address, he looked old and frail while seated at his desk. However, his declining health has been kept a secret from the general public. Now they have to contend with the fact that their leader, for over a decade, will not see them through World War II. Germany will surrender in less than a month, but there's still the Japanese threat in the Pacific. Less than 24 hours after FDR's death, the United States has a new president, Harry S. Truman, is sworn in and briefed on the Manhattan Project and the progress of the atomic bomb. July 16, 1945, 5.29 a.m., 21 days before the atomic bomb is dropped on Japan. Sirens wail across Los Alamos. The Trinity test is about to begin. Gadget, the first atomic bomb to ever be tested, hangs 100 feet above the sand of Alamogordo bombing range. Oppenheimer glances at his watch. The experiment will commence in the next 45 seconds. When the timer hits zero, the plutonium implosion device will detonate, and the largest man-made explosion that has ever been created will possibly destroy the planet. 30 seconds until detonation. Military officials, scientists, and engineers are at observation points between 5 and 10 miles away from ground zero. They're ordered to lie on their stomachs with their heads pointed away from the bomb. Everyone in attendance gets down on the ground, puts on their protective goggles, and waits for the countdown to reach zero. This is the moment they've all been waiting for. If the test succeeds, the United States will have the most powerful weapon the world has ever known. 15 seconds until detonation. The skies are dark. Rain falls on the parched desert sands. Lightning illuminates the sky in the distance. It's the perfect day to test a doomsday weapon. Gadget detonates. At 5.29 and 45 seconds, the bomb is triggered. There's a blinding flash of light that illuminates the mountain peaks 10 miles away. All is quiet for a brief moment. Then, there's the deafening sound of the explosion. Hurricane-force winds sweep across the test site, blowing sand and debris over the desert. After several seconds, observers throughout the area turn toward ground zero. A 40,000-foot mushroom cloud rises up into the sky. Where the tower once stood is now only a crater with a glassy jade-colored mineral covering the surface. This substance would later be named Trinitite. As far as 50 miles away, people report seeing the explosion. Citizens phone the authorities asking what happened out in the desert. Windows of houses 125 miles away shatter. Residents in Gallup, New Mexico, 180 miles from Alamogordo bombing range, say they felt the ground shake. Later, the government will release a brief statement to the press, giving an explanation for the large explosion and the phenomena associated with it. 
A remotely located ammunition magazine containing a considerable amount of high explosives and pyrotechnics exploded, but there was no loss of life or limb to anyone. This is clearly a lie, but the government can't let anyone know what has just occurred at Los Alamos. The atomic bomb must remain a secret until the opportune moment when the US military is ready to unleash its power on their enemies. Oppenheimer stands with his mouth open, staring at the aftermath of the weapon of mass destruction he played an integral role in creating. A line from a Hindu passage passes through his thoughts, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The mushroom cloud continues to grow larger and larger. July 16th, late afternoon. Top military officials receive a communication stating the atomic bomb test at Los Alamos has been a success. The weapon is everything they hoped for and more. Military leaders have been grappling with the reality of what is unfolding in the Pacific. Japan will not give up. It seems as if the only way to end the war is by invading the home island itself. This is estimated to result in 1.7 to 4 million US casualties. That number is staggering, but it may be the only way to force the Japanese leadership to surrender. Now, there's another option. The United States can use its newest and most powerful weapon to force Japan's hand. An order is sent to military bases on the west coast that have components for several atomic bombs stored at their facilities. They're to begin shipping the parts of the bomb to an island within striking distance of Japan. Early that evening, the USS Indianapolis leaves San Francisco. On board the ship is a gun assembly mechanism for detonating the atomic weapon. About half of the US supply of uranium-235 and several Los Alamos scientists who will oversee the construction of the bombs. The rest of the United States stockpile of uranium-235 is loaded onto a transport plane and flown to Tinian Island. This is where everything will come together before a nuclear attack is launched against Japan. July 26, 1945, 11 days before the atomic bomb is dropped on Japan. The USS Indianapolis reaches Tinian Island. Assembly of Little Boy begins. Later when the plutonium arrives by aircraft, the construction of Fat Man starts. The big three, Truman, Churchill, and Stalin are at the Potsdam Conference in Germany when Truman receives a message reporting the successful test of the atomic bomb at Los Alamos. Truman leans over to Stalin. I've just received word that the US scientists have created a new weapon of unusual destructive force, he says. The time for a Japanese surrender is at hand. Stalin hesitates for a moment. His own scientists have been working around the clock to harness the power of the atom and make their own bomb. He's slightly annoyed that the US beat him to it. Very well, Stalin replies. Let's contact Tokyo. The Big Three issue an ultimatum to Japan. It states that they either surrender unconditionally or face prompt and utter destruction. There's no response to their request. After dropping off the components for the bombs, the Indianapolis departs for the Philippines where it will continue to aid in the war effort. Four days later, it is sunk by the Japanese submarine I-58. 900 out of the 1,200 sailors survive the attack and float in the dark Pacific water. The men are accidentally stumbled upon by US ships four days later. Only 316 men survived. It's theorized from first-hand accounts and the carnage left in the water that hundreds of men were attacked and eaten by oceanic white-tipped sharks while they waited for rescue. August 2, 1945, four days before the atomic bomb is dropped on Japan. It's been decided that the United States will not launch a land invasion of Japan, but will force them to surrender by using their newest weapon instead. No one except the highest-ranking US officials and the scientists present at the Trinity test knows the power of the atomic bomb. However, no one can predict the destructive power and the deadly aftermath of the bomb, as this will be the first time anything like it has been used in warfare. The collateral damage will be immense, but the US feels it needs to send a clear message in order to get the Japanese leadership to end the war. The US military is watching the weather over Japan. They're waiting for the opportune moment to carry out their attack. The targets have been narrowed down. Kokura, Hiroshima, Niigata, and Kyoto. Although Kyoto was the top of the list, Secretary of War Henry Louis Stimson pleaded with President Truman to reconsider due to its historical and cultural significance. Truman agrees Kyoto is swapped out for Nagasaki. August 6, 1945, 2.30 a.m., five hours and 45 minutes before the atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. Colonel Paul Tibbetts walks around the B-29 that will be flown to Japan to drop the atomic bomb named Little Boy. His crew is gathered and made final preparations. Tibbetts stops at the nose of the plane and looks at the hull. George, can you come over here for a second? asks Tibbetts. A maintenance worker walks over to the plane. Tibbetts whispers something into his ear. The maintenance worker leaves and comes back with stencils and paint. He gets to work writing something on the nose of the aircraft. After a few minutes, he steps away. Tibbetts smiles at his mother's name that's now painted on the hull of the aircraft. 2.45 a.m. Five hours and 30 minutes before the atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. Tibbetts pushes the throttle forward. The engines of the B-29 Super Fortress, now named the Enola Gay, roar to life. The aircraft picks up speed as it races down the runway. 
Tibbets pulls back on the flight stick. The plane rises in the air. It's a little unwieldy due to the modifications made to the craft, which allow it to carry and drop atomic bombs. A few seconds after liftoff, Tibbets feels a slight dip and his stomach sinks. He makes a few adjustments and the plane begins to climb again. He breathes a sigh of relief. However, he knows the hardest part is yet to come. Moments later, two other B-29s take off from the airfield on Tinian Island. They'll provide reconnaissance on the targets for the Enola Gay to make sure their conditions are right to drop the bomb. They'll also be used to film the detonation of the atomic device and the immediate aftermath. Once the Enola Gay levels off, Captain William Parsons begins adding the final component to Little Boy. This was not done prior to takeoff because several of the modified B-29s crashed during flight tests. A major concern is that if a B-29 crashes with a fully assembled bomb on board, it might detonate and wipe out the entire military base on Tinian Island. This might serve as a demonstration of the destructive power of the atomic bomb, but not in the way the US had hoped for. Therefore, the atomic bomb aboard the Ganola Gay was not fully assembled until the B-29 was in the air and a safe distance away from the base. We're good to go, Colonel, Parson says over the radio once he finishes preparations on Little Boy. Roger that, Tibbets confirms. He continues to fly toward the home island of Japan. 8.15 AM, one second before the atomic bomb detonates over Hiroshima. Little Boy falls to an altitude of 1,900 feet. The gun assembly device fires and critical mass is achieved when the uranium projectile strikes the uranium target within the bomb. This results in the initiation of a chain reaction. Atoms split, neutrons are ripped from their nuclei. This creates a massive amount of energy resulting in an atomic explosion directly over Shima Hospital in Hiroshima. When the bomb detonates, the temperature directly below the blast reaches 12,600 degrees Fahrenheit, or around 7,000 degrees Celsius. Everything within the vicinity is immediately incinerated, including people, vehicles, and buildings. The blast wave levels any structures within its radius, destroying around two-thirds of the city. Out of the 343,000 inhabitants living in Hiroshima, around 70,000 are killed almost instantly. Another 30,000 will be dead within the year from severe burns and radiation poisoning. All that remains of anyone caught in the thermal radiation blast is their nuclear shadows imprinted on the stone structures of Hiroshima. Their bodies shielded the stone from the radiation, keeping it from being bleached by the intense heat and leaving an imprint of their body forever etched into the rock. As the Enola Gay speeds away, it's rocked by the shockwave of the atomic bomb. Hold on to something, Tibbets yells over the headset. The crew is restrained to their seats by safety harnesses. If they'd not been wearing them, they would have been tossed around the fuselage like pinballs. Tibbets clutches the flight stick tightly with both hands. He adjusts the angle of the B-29 to level the plane out. Moments later, the air is still once again. Tibbets climbs to cruising altitude and begins the journey back to Tinian Island. 8.18 AM, three minutes after the atomic bomb detonated over Hiroshima. The mushroom cloud from the blast rises higher and higher into the air, reaching 40,000 feet above the ground. Less than 2% of the uranium contained within Little Boy achieved fission, yet the destruction is utterly unbelievable. The bomb released is the equivalent of more than 15,000 tons of TNT on the city of Hiroshima. A member of the Enola Gay's crew looks back at the destruction from a window. Good God, what have we done? He says into his headset. For a minute, there is only silence. We saved American lives, someone responds. But at what cost? A third voice says. The crew is silent for much of the journey back to base. 8.15 PM, 12 hours after the atomic bomb detonated over Hiroshima, the Enola Gay touches down at Tinian. Upon disembarking, the crew is greeted by cheers and applause. Colonel Paul Tibbets is awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his actions. Four hours later, President Harry Truman addresses the American people. Sixteen hours ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima, an important Japanese army base. That bomb had more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. Some listeners shake their head in dismay. Others are terrified of what this weapon could be used for in the future, and yet the majority smile at the awesome power that the United States now wields. Truman continues, It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. The world has changed forever. August 8, 1945, one day before the atomic bomb is dropped on Nagasaki. As news of the destruction of Hiroshima circulates around the world, people grapple with the consequences of such a powerful weapon. It's almost incomprehensible. Some in Japanese leadership claim that since their own atomic program has stalled due to difficulties in procuring materials, Perhaps the United States only had that one bomb. Others argue that it's time to reach a settlement with the US and its allies. Advocates for surrendering note that if the US could build and drop one atomic bomb, it's only a matter of time before they can do it again. At this point, the Soviet Union has yet to declare war on Japan. 
It's proposed by some Japanese officials that Stalin might be willing to mediate negotiations between the United States and Japan. However, before anything can become of such an idea, the Soviet Union declares war. Their forces push into Manchuria and Sakhalin Island. Japan will receive no help from the Soviets, only death and destruction. August 9, 1945, 3.47 a.m., 10 hours and 15 minutes before the atomic bomb is dropped on Nagasaki. The United States has still not received word of a Japanese surrender. There is growing unease as the Soviet forces move closer and closer to the main island of Japan. U.S. leadership worries that if the Soviet Union invades and forces a surrender, they may claim Japan and much of the territory it conquered during the war for their own. The U.S. cannot let this happen. The boxcar, a B-29 loaded with the Fat Man atomic bomb, takes off from Tinian and proceeds toward Japan. Major Charles Sweeney is at the controls. The bomb the boxcar carries is more powerful than the one dropped on Hiroshima, and it is plutonium-fueled similar to the bomb detonated during the Trinity test at Alamogordo bombing range. While taking off, Sweeney is particularly cheerful. Unlike the little boy bomb, Fat Man is already completely assembled in its cargo hold. Once the plane is safely in the air, Commander Frederick Ashworth arms the bomb. Again, two other B-29s accompany the boxcar on their mission to ensure the targets are visible. At the time of takeoff, clear skies with light haze are reported over the primary target of Kokura. Sweeney pilots the plane toward this destination. 9.45 a.m one hour and 17 minutes before the atomic bomb is dropped on Nagasaki. I can't see anything, Sweeney exclaims over the radio. The weather over Kokura has deteriorated. Visibility of the city below is nearly zero. This might have been caused by the firebombing runs conducted on the nearby city of Yahata the night before. I'm circling around for another pass, Sweeney says. On the second time around, the city below is still covered by haze and clouds. There is no way to tell where the target is and when to drop the bomb. Can anyone see anything? Sweeney shouts as he circles back for one more pass, hoping that there's a break in the overcast skies. Their target is a massive arsenal that contains large stores of weapons and explosives that the Japanese desperately need if they're going to mount a defense of their home island. The destruction of the target makes sense in the scheme of the war, but if the crew of the boxcar can't sight it, they could hit the wrong part of the city and leave the arsenal unharmed. Sweeney checks the fuel gauge. They've been circling above Kokura for nearly 45 minutes. The clouds have not cleared. Time is slowly slipping away. I'm calling it off, Sweeney says over the radio. There's an eerie stillness throughout the aircraft as the crew waits for the Major's next decision. We're moving to the secondary target, prepare to drop the bomb over Nagasaki. 10.58 AM, four minutes before the atomic bomb is dropped on Nagasaki. Damn it, Sweeney yells. The cloud cover here is worse than at Kokura. He looks out the cockpit window to try to identify any landmarks below. Captain Kermit Bien is serving as bombardier on the mission and looks through his scope to try to locate the Mitsubishi arms plant. The structure is supposed to be their target in Nagasaki. Bian, you see anything? Sweeney asks. It's bad, Major. All I can see is clouds, Colonel Bian responds. Sweeney glances at the fuel gauge again. We're not going to make it, he thinks. Major, I got something, Bian says over the headset. A clearing in the clouds has appeared in the northern part of the city. It's not their pre-planned target, but it is close enough that the bomb will take out the arms plant in the blast. Drop it, Sweeney yells. 11.02 AM, the atomic bomb drops on Nagasaki. Fat Man falls to an altitude of 1,650 feet. The detonation mechanism triggers. The subcritical plutonium core is surrounded by several thousand pounds of explosives. They're arranged in a way that when they detonate, the explosive forces are directed inward toward the plutonium core. The force of the explosion crushes the plutonium into a supercritical state, and a nuclear chain reaction commences. This type of atomic bomb creates a much bigger explosion than Little Boy. Fat Man goes off with a force of 21,000 tons of TNT. 40,000 people are instantly vaporized, and another 30,000 will die in the aftermath from radiation poisoning. 40% of the city's buildings are destroyed. As the mushroom cloud erupts into the air, the shockwave strikes the boxcar rattling the hull of the plane. Sweeney regains control and steers the craft further away from the spreading cloud of debris. Sweeney wipes sweat from his brow as he looks at the fuel gauge. There isn't enough fuel to make it back to Tinian. He looks at the map and decides their best chance is to get to Okinawa in the south of Japan. The island is under U.S. control, so if they can make it, it should be a safe place to land. The challenge is to reach the island before the boxcar runs out of fuel and plummets into the choppy, shark-filled waters of the Pacific. Sweeney informs his crew of the new plan. Most are still in shock from the explosion they just witnessed. They had heard of the destructive power of the bomb, but seeing it firsthand is different. Several hours later, a voice crackles over the radio. This is Major Charles Sweeney of the boxcar. We are coming in for an emergency landing. Roger that, Major, responds flight control from Yonten Airfield on Okinawa. The runway's all yours, you're clear for landing. Sweeney eases back on the throttle. The B-29 descends and touches down on the tarmac. The fuel needle gently rests on E. 
August 10, 1945, one day after the atomic bomb detonated over Hiroshima. Emperor Hirohito supports accepting terms laid out by the Allies. The Japanese government releases a statement saying they'll surrender but only if the emperor is allowed to keep his position as a sovereign ruler of the nation. The United States rejects this counteroffer and makes their position clear. They want the unconditional surrender of Japan, or there will be further consequences. President Truman is in constant communication with General Groves. Yes, Mr. President, we already have another bomb ready for shipment. Should reach the Pacific in a matter of days, says Groves. The president thanks him and has his military advisors draw plans for a third atomic bombing run on Japan. August 14, 1945 Japan surrenders. The Japanese government accepts the Allies' terms for unconditional surrender. The next day, Emperor Hirohito is heard on every radio across the country. The pre-recorded message is played on every station. It is the first time Japan's people have heard the Emperor's voice in a long time. Tears are shed. Many cannot believe that Japan has been defeated. Others refuse to accept it altogether. The future of Japan is uncertain, but one thing is clear. They will not be able to rule themselves for some time. The U.S. military will occupy Japan for the next seven years. September 2, 1945 The war in the Pacific officially comes to an end. The USS Missouri sits in the Tokyo Bay. Its deck has been outfitted with a table and chairs. Resting on the table are the instruments of surrender. Foreign Minister Mamoru Shigemitsu and General Yoshijiro Yumitsu approach the table while U.S. officers and sailors look on. The documents are signed. World War II officially comes to an end. Cheers erupt around the world as the most bloody conflict in human history is now over. Fighting will continue sporadically throughout the Pacific until word can reach soldiers in the furthest reaches of the conflict that the war has ended. Astonishingly, some will even continue fighting for decades. The last official surrender by a Japanese soldier occurs on March 9, 1974, when Lieutenant Hiro Onoda finally hands over his sword in the Philippine jungle. In the coming decades, the after-effects of the atomic bombs dropped on Japan will come to light. Thousands will suffer from radiation poisoning. Countless civilians will die from cancer. The contamination of the soil and water will last for years. It'll be argued that the United States had to use the atomic bombs to force a Japanese surrender, that launching an invasion of the home island would have caused much more death and destruction than the bombs did. The other side will advocate for reparations, that the United States massacred innocent men, women, and children. They'll say that using the atomic bomb was irresponsible. Regardless of which side is right, the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki still remain the only two instances where nuclear weapons have been used in a war. Perhaps their sacrifice avoided an all-out nuclear holocaust during the Cold War to come. This video is sponsored by Conflict of Nations, the free online strategy game where you get to find out what it's like to take control of a real country and lead it in modern global warfare. You'll take on up to 128 other players in real-time games that can take weeks to complete, using armies filled with diverse units like powerful tanks, jet airplanes, and even nuclear submarines. But there's more than just fighting on the battlefields. My favorite part of the game is the social strategy side, forging alliances and declaring war on other real players. It's fully cross-platform, so you can play on the same account on PC and mobile. We'll be hosting a custom game for the first viewers that click the link in the description with instructions on how to join at the end of the video, so make sure you stick around. Infographic Show viewers also get a special gift of 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free when they use the link. It's only available for 30 days, so click the link, choose a country, and start fighting your way to victory right now. On August 6, 1945, an American B-29 bomber flying low over the Japanese city of Hiroshima dropped the world's first atomic bomb on the city's unsuspecting inhabitants, immediately killing 80,000 innocent civilians. Three days later, a second bomb was dropped in the city of Nagasaki, killing a further 40,000 men, women, and children. In the aftermath of the bomb's initial explosions, tens of thousands more people would die excruciatingly painful deaths due to radiation exposure. While the world may be familiar with the tragic story of the first use of the atomic bomb, we are less familiar with exactly how it works. The atomic bomb was a devastating act of cruelty, but also a technological marvel that would forever alter the face of war. The devastating bombing of Japan was enough to deter the use of nuclear weapons for at least a few decades, but after World War II, increasing tension between the US and Russia led to the Cold War, a nuclear arms race between the two world powers that saw both sides rushing to increase their stockpile of nuclear weapons, ostensibly as a means to deter war. People built bunkers in their backyards and stocked up on canned goods, schools ran nuclear war drills, and the world waited with bated breath for the outbreak of nuclear war and what felt like the imminent end of the world. But although the existence of nuclear weapons was common knowledge, and despite the widespread panic about the nuclear war, 
few people truly understood just how an atomic bomb works. To understand how the atomic bomb works, we have to take a trip back to high school physics class to revisit the concepts of atomic structure and radioactivity. An atom is one of the smallest units of matter, and it's made up of three subatomic particles. The nucleus at the center of the atom is made up of protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which have a neutral charge. Negatively charged electrons orbit the nucleus of the atom. When the ratio of protons to neutrons is one to one, the atom as a whole will have a neutral charge. But if the number of protons in an atom is changed, an entirely different element will be created. If the number of neutrons changes, you end up with an isotope. For example, the carbon atom has three naturally occurring isotopes in its common stable form. Carbon-12 has six protons and six neutrons. Carbon-13 has six protons but seven neutrons. And while rare, it's still a stable element. Carbon-14, with its six protons and eight neutrons, is both rare and unstable, or radioactive. Radioactive nuclei emit particles called radiation through a process called radioactive decay, and it's this process that scientists harness to create the powerful atomic bomb. There are a few different ways to destabilize a particle, but for understanding how nuclear bombs work, the most important processes to grasp are fission and fusion. Fission involves splitting the nucleus of an atom in two, which scientists can do by bombarding it with free neutrons. As the nucleus splits, it ejects neutrons along with bursts of electromagnetic energy called gamma rays. Fusion, in contrast, involves bringing together the nucleus of two atoms to form a single larger one. This is actually the process by which our sun produces energy. Through endless experimentation and a process of trial and error, scientists eventually discovered that uranium was the element that was most cooperative in inducing a fission reaction. The isotope uranium-235 is one of the few materials that can be forced to undergo fission by bombarding its nucleus with neutrons, rather than waiting 700 million years for it to decay naturally. U-235's nucleus will readily absorb the neutrons, become unstable and split, throwing off two or three new neutrons in the process. Those new neutrons can then go on to collide with the nucleus of other U-235 atoms, starting a fission chain reaction. The splitting of the nucleus happens incredibly quickly, in the order of picoseconds, or 0.00000000001 seconds. Yeah, that's 11 zeros. The scientific principles underlying the atomic bomb had been well known since Einstein's days, but they wouldn't be successfully applied and weaponized until the Second World War. In the 1930s, Italian scientist Enrico Fermi successfully bombarded elements with neutrons, transforming them into new elements, and shortly thereafter, German scientists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann were the first to fission uranium by bombarding it with neutrons, producing the radioactive barium isotope. These breakthroughs led the scientific community to wonder if it would be possible to create a fission chain reaction that could release enormous amounts of energy that could be harnessed and weaponized, an idea that greatly intrigued the world's governments, who were in the midst of fighting World War II at the time. In an effort to be the first to weaponize fission and beat the Nazis to the punch, the US government recruited the brightest minds in physics from all over the world and launched the secretive Manhattan Project with the goal of creating the world's first functional atomic bomb. In 1941, scientists at Columbia University tried to initiate a chain reaction using uranium-235, but failed. Shortly thereafter, Fermi, now working for the U.S. at the University of Chicago, successfully achieved the world's first controlled nuclear chain reaction in his lab underneath the school's squash courts. Also in 1941, Berkeley scientists discovered a new element, element 94, with nuclear fuel potential, which they named plutonium. With these discoveries, the race to develop a nuclear bomb was on in earnest, and within just a few short years, the world's first nuclear bombs would be used in war. Understanding the concept of fission was only part of the problem. Figuring out how to weaponize it and construct devices to harness atomic power was a whole other challenge. Critical mass is the minimum amount of material needed to sustain a chain reaction, so to harness the nuclear power, the nuclear fuel has to be kept in separate subcritical masses that won't support fission. When it's time to detonate, the subcritical masses are brought together to form a supercritical mass, and free neutrons are introduced to jumpstart the fission process. A small pellet made of the elements polonium and beryllium serves as the neutron generator, and the entire reaction is confined within a dense material called a tamper, usually made of another uranium isotope, U-238, to reflect the neutrons back into the core and slow the core's expansion to ensure that as much fission as possible happens before the bomb explodes. Scientists developed two trigger systems for the first atomic bombs. Little Boy, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, was a gun-triggered bomb. 
with a 14.5 kiloton yield, equal in power to 14,500 tons of TNT. Little Boy was 1.5% efficient, meaning that 1.5% of the material fissioned before the bomb exploded. In a gun-fired nuclear weapon, a bullet of uranium-235 is placed in one end of a long tube packed with explosives, which will fire the bullet down the tube where it collides with the neutron generator, initiating fission and starting the chain reaction that will lead to the bomb's explosion. In contrast, Fat Man, the bomb that was dropped in Nagasaki, was an implosion device with a 23 kiloton yield and 17% efficiency. Much more effective, but also much more complicated to make than Little Boy. Implosion bombs feature a sphere of radioactive U-235 as the tamper around a plutonium-239 core. The entire sphere is surrounded by high explosives, which when detonated create a shockwave that compress the core and initiates the fission chain reaction. In the wake of World War II, scientists recognized that fission bombs were wildly inefficient and turned their attention to fusion next. Fusion bombs, also called thermonuclear or hydrogen bombs, rely on the hydrogen isotopes deuterium and tritium as fuel, and can yield up to 10,000 kilotons, making them up to 700 times more powerful than the Little Boy fission bomb. Hydrogen bombs combine fission and fusion to achieve a more powerful and more efficient explosion. Within the bomb's casing is a tamper made of U-235, which is packed with hydrogen isotope fuel, and surrounds a hollow rod of plutonium-239 at the core. An implosion fission device detonates first, compressing the fuel and causing the plutonium core to fission. The fissioning rod in turn gives off heat and pressure which initiates fusion in the hydrogen isotopes and causes the bomb to explode. The entire process takes just 600 billionths of a second. Not only have the bombs themselves improved drastically, but the delivery methods have come a long way since World War II. Philip Morrison, a former member of the Manhattan Project, told Scientific American in 1995 that all three bombs of 1945, the Trinity test bomb and the two bombs dropped on Japan, were more nearly improvised pieces of complex laboratory equipment than they were reliable weaponry. Today, nuclear weapons come in many forms, from ballistic missiles that can exit the atmosphere and travel thousands of miles before re-entering and detonating, to cruise missiles, shorter range missiles with smaller warheads that are harder to detect and intercept to a range of tactical nuclear weapons like artillery shells and landmines that can target a smaller area. Nuclear weapons are terrifying because of their immense destructive power relative to their size. The most severe damage happens at the blast's hypocenter, or ground zero, where everything is immediately vaporized. Outward from the center, most of the damage is the result of flying debris, intense heat, a powerful shock wave, and acute exposure to high radiation. Beyond the immediate blast area, death and injury can result from heat and resulting fires, as well as from radiation. The physical destruction caused by a nuclear bomb is no doubt catastrophic, but the most dangerous part of a nuclear bomb is the radiation and radioactive fallout. After the initial explosion, clouds of fine dust made of radioactive particles are carried away by the wind and fall back to the ground, poisoning the water supply and getting ingested and inhaled by people even miles away from the blast. We now know that radiation affects the cells in our body that readily divide, like hair and gut cells, bone marrow and reproductive organs, leading to nausea, vomiting and diarrhea, and long-term health consequences like cataracts, hair loss, loss of blood cells, and an increased risk of leukemia, cancer, infertility, and birth defects. At the height of the Cold War in the 1980s, scientists warned about the danger of a nuclear winter. In a worst-case scenario, so many nuclear bombs could explode that great clouds of radioactive dust could travel high into the atmosphere, blocking out sunlight and lowering surface temperatures. This could lead to a major disruption in the food chain and mass extinctions of species, including humans. The Cold War may be over, but the threat of nuclear war is by no means gone. Countries around the world have signed treaties agreeing to limit their stockpile of nuclear weapons and prohibiting them from using them against other countries, but still, the number of nuclear weapons around the world continues to grow. And not all countries have agreed to use them responsibly. At least nine countries currently have ballistic nuclear weapons, and three of those countries, the US, Russia, and China, have weapons powerful enough to hit any target anywhere in the world. And then there's North Korea. In 2009, they tested a nuclear bomb as powerful as the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, and the underground test explosion caused a magnitude 4.5 earthquake. There's no doubt that nuclear warfare still presents a huge threat to world peace, not to mention the continuation of the species. Thanks again to our sponsor Conflict of Nations, the free online PvP strategy game set in a modern global warfare. 
We've set up a custom game for our viewers. Click the link in the description, create an account, and enter the game code infographics and password infographics to join today. You hear nothing as the world around you suddenly glows bright, as if someone fired off a tungsten ball at full power. Then the sound catches up with you, just in time to hurl you across the room and smash you against the opposite wall. A blizzard of glass, shrapnel, and concrete splinters tear through the room and rake your body, leaving behind deep, bloody tears in your clothing. The building around you rumbles as it breaks and showers debris down on you. A massive support beam crashes down, missing your head by inches. You try to breathe, but your lungs are instantly choked with dust, and by instinct you begin trying to free yourself from the debris. Every breath just brings more choking dust. And despite your numerous wounds, your pressing need for fresh air overrides any feelings of pain. You try and stand, but your body doesn't respond, so instead you're forced to crawl toward a dim source of light breaking through the gray cloud of dust. Moments ago it had been a perfectly clear sunny day, and now you can barely make out the light of what you think is the outside through the haze. The debris you drag yourself through has been superheated and burns your hands and knees terribly, but you have no choice but to keep crawling forward toward the light. You can feel yourself asphyxiating from the lack of oxygen, your lungs struggling to pull in oxygen through the thick cloud of dust that seems to have settled over the entire world. Finally, with blistered hands, you crawl through a hole in the debris and fall forward, tumbling out into the street. The scene that awaits you is almost too much to believe. Barely 30 seconds ago, you'd been speaking to your boss, seated at his desk with a window behind him overlooking the street below. The sky was perfectly clear, save for a few stray clouds, and the sun shone fiercely. Outside, people went about their daily business, unlike almost every other major Japanese city. Hiroshima had been left completely untouched by American firebombing raids. You shuddered to hear the reports coming from across Japan of massive firestorms started by American bombs, leaving nothing but ash in their wake and tens of thousands dead. A horrifying thought, but had the war gone differently, it would have been Portland or San Francisco and Los Angeles in ashes. War was hell, but nothing could have prepared you for this. The firebombing raids had sparked blazes that lasted for days, but the once thriving city of Hiroshima has been reduced to ash and rubble in half a minute. The destruction is almost too much to comprehend, and looming above you, filling the once clear blue sky, is a massive pillar of dust and ash miles high, topped with a foreboding mushroom cloud that roils with soot blackened clouds, spreading across the horizon at incredible speed. You're lucky, you were over a mile from the detonation point and looking in that direction all you can see is a barren moonscape of rubble. Like most Japanese cities, the majority of Hiroshima's buildings are made of wood, and the atomic blast instantly leveled these. Only a few brick and mortar buildings were left standing across a landscape of ash. Suddenly you feel the wind begin to pick up, and in the span of moments a hurricane force gale tears through the shattered cityscape. Debris is sent flying by the hurricane winds, and you do your best to flatten yourself as best you can while trying not to get blown away. Before you, another survivor is being picked up by the wind when suddenly a large wooden slat smashes into them hard enough to send them flying. The impact is so sudden there isn't even a scream, as you simply watch their broken body get blown away into the smoky fog and haze that settled around you. Just as suddenly as it began, the wind dies, leaving behind an eerie silence in its wake. Other sounds begin to fill the void, the roaring of fires, the cracking and breaking of buildings around you, and the high-pitched screams of animals in distress. No. Not animals, you realize. People. Survivors. A man stumbles through the thick haze, his high-pitched screams almost inhuman. Finally, thankfully, his voice cracks and breaks, and his screams turn to loud, ragged wheezing. His clothes hang on his body in shreds as he stumbles toward you, and it appears that he's no longer wearing shoes. As he draws nearer, you make a horrifying discovery. It's not his clothes that are hanging off him in tattered shreds, it's his flesh. He was caught out in the open when the bomb exploded and the searing heat burned his clothing off in a flash, melting and flaying his very flesh until it hangs off his bones in long, ragged strips. Despite yourself, you choke and gag from the vomit that fills your mouth. Mercifully, the man slumps to the ground just a few feet away from you, his ragged wheezing slowing and finally stopping. Death is a mercy for the horribly disfigured stranger, but you can hear the screams of dozens, hundreds of others all around you in a similar state. It's as if after the deafening silence of the massive blast, the world had held its breath for just a moment and then began to scream in agony all at once. As if on cue your brain is now finally starting to recognize your own wounds and sorting through the dozens of pain signals. Compared to others around you, you're in relatively good shape. The blast threw you across the room, but you were lucky enough to be in one of the few brick buildings in the city. The thick walls held up enough to shield you from the initial explosion, but spalding from the massive blast showered you in a razor-sharp blizzard of concrete shards.
Your hands and knees are thoroughly burned through, and blisters have already formed on the palms of your hands from where you crawled over the superheated wreckage to get to safety. More horrifying is your left arm. You remember standing in front of your boss's desk, the sunshine coming through the window behind you, reaching up to your arm, bathing it in pleasant warmth. This was the only part of your body exposed to the bomb's detonation several hundred feet above the city center, reaching temperatures of a few million degrees in a matter of nanoseconds, even at a mile away was enough to severely burn and blister your exposed arm, and some of the blisters have torn open in your mad scramble to safety. Now the pain washes over you with such intensity that you nearly black out, and you have to fight your way back to consciousness. You're thirsty, incredibly thirsty, more thirsty than you've ever been before. The temperature around you is easily over 100 degrees and you can physically feel it getting warmer by the minute. Your tongue has swelled significantly and now sticks to the roof of your mouth. You have to find water, but looking at the wreckage around you, you wouldn't even know where to look. Then you remember the river. You have to get to the river. The wind is picking up again, this time blowing superheated gusts of air that spread fiery embers amongst the ruins. Like a giant bellows, the gusts of wind feed the fires, growing them in size and intensity. The fire moves incredibly fast, almost like a living being, and you watch in horror as a patch of fire is suddenly whipped into a frenzy by the blowing wind, jumping across the street and consuming a group of people still trying to free others from the wreckage. The would-be rescuers and the victims still trapped in the ruins are incinerated in moments. You can't even hear their screams over the sounds of the roaring flames and hundreds of other human beings in similar distress. You've still got your shoes on, and you're grateful for that small mercy. Several survivors around you have somehow lost one or both of their shoes in the blast, and you can see their bare feet blister on contact with red-hot debris. But they push on anyway, seemingly with the same idea as you. Get to the river. To remain here means death. Above you, the massive mushroom cloud has now blocked out the entire sky, turning a bright sunny morning into dusk. Suddenly, big, fat, greasy drops of rain begin to fall from the sky, and you're grateful at first, turning your head up and opening your mouth wide. Your parched throat is eager for water, any water at all, but you choke as a few of the oversized drops land in your mouth and you try to swallow them down. They taste of ash. As you watch people wipe the black rain off their faces, you see the long, dark streaks it leaves behind. It is ash. Ash of thousands of vaporized buildings, atomized vehicles, bicycles, bridges, and people. The blast has caused a massive cloud of soil and dust, which is borne upwards by the superheated winds. At the top of the black column, the mushroom head above you has spread out for thousands of meters in either direction, cooling and being condensed into rain as the pressure drops with elevation. The raging fires set off by the atomic bomb have sent plumes of more dust and moisture high up into the air, mixing with the atomic cloud. The two phenomena combine a mile over your head, resulting in massive black rain droplets the size of your fingertip. You're desperate for moisture, but fight the instinct to happily lap up that falling rain. Others around you, however, can't help themselves and try to drink their fill of the ominous black rain. That will prove a fatal mistake, as the would-be survivors ingest massive quantities of highly radioactive debris. The irradiated dust and ash will burn them from the inside, causing horrendous damage before being passed by the digestive system. It'll be fatal in most cases. You rush forward against the black rain and gusts of superheated wind. The fires are raging in full force now, and you're being physically driven back from the heat of intense flames as much as 30 feet away from you. Working your way through the ruined city is like navigating an invisible maze, as you try to feel the safe, cooler areas in between raging infernos. At some points, you have to grit your teeth and plunge in between two massive fires, the radiating heat causing first-degree burns on your exposed skin. You see others attempt the same feat, but in their weakened condition they collapse from the waves of heat and fall face forward. Some pitifully try to crawl forward, but the fires are so intense that they slowly cook them alive, even from a great distance away. Finally up ahead, there's a break in the debris. You know this city, your hometown, like the back of your hand, but it's almost impossible to navigate through the fires, the thick haze, and the pouring black rain. There are no visible landmarks anymore to give you a sense of direction, and you can only guess as to the direction of the river based on a few city parks that you pass by, some of the only areas void of any major destruction thanks to there having been no buildings built on them. Here people have begun to gather as they seek refuge from the blazing infernos around them. Some of the parks are too close to the burning buildings though, and as the fire sweeps through the ruins and surrounds the smaller parks, the people huddling for safety inside of them are slowly cooked alive. You know where you are now though, or at least you know that you're close to the river. You push against the pain and the horror with the last of your remaining strength, stumbling out of the debris and onto the sloping bank of the Ota River. Your momentum carries you forward though and you lose your balance as you roll down the bank toward the river below. Your numerous injuries are aggravated by the fall, and the blisters forming on the exposed flesh of your body are painfully ripped open once more. 
But soon, you're in the water and despite yourself feel relief for the first time since the world became a waking nightmare. You're surprised though, the normally cool river water is shockingly warm heated by the massive firestorm overtaking the entire city of Hiroshima. There's others here who rushed your aid though and helped pick you up. You're all in similar shape. You were the strong ones or the ones with the least serious injuries who managed to claw their way out of the hellscape that has become Hiroshima. The rest are dead and there's nothing anyone could have done to save them. Finally, you can't bear it any longer as you plunge your filthy hands into the river and scoop up mouthfuls of water you greedily choke down. The river water is black too, choked by debris and ash from the city it runs through, but at least it's cleaner and safer to drink than the black rain that still falls from the twilight sky. You have no idea that what will come next is the death of tens of thousands more to horrible radiation sickness or infection from terrible third degree burns. You have no idea that in just three days another bomb will be dropped over Nagasaki, another city so far spared the wrath of the war, only this bomb will be many times more powerful than the one dropped on your hometown. Like the people of Hiroshima, the citizens of Nagasaki have been spared so far on purpose, as part of a grand experiment to see just how devastating the newly developed atomic bomb truly is. They'll hear of your plight in a day or two. The reports from Hiroshima are so astonishing that most will outright refuse to believe it. One man who will immediately accept the reality of nuclear warfare though is Yoshio Nishina, Japan's chief nuclear physicist and head of the nation's own efforts to build an atomic weapon. Confused by the devastation, he'll be dispatched to Hiroshima, arriving within 24 hours and confirming the worst. The city has been the victim of an atomic attack. Adolf Hitler is dead. The Red Army is rejoicing, despite losing around 18 million people. The UK and the US are already discussing the perils of communism. As many as 85 million people have died during six years and one day of bloody fighting. But it's not over just yet. Japan is still fighting, and it isn't looking like the country will surrender. As you know, Two bombs fixed that problem. But what if they hadn't been dropped? That's what we'll find out today. The war in Europe officially ended on May 8, 1945. People took to the streets, waving handkerchiefs in the air and shouting about peace on earth. Flags and banners lined the streets of Britain when Winston Churchill made one of his moving speeches. My dear friends, this is your hour. This is not victory of a party or of any class. It is a victory of the great British nation as a whole. We were the first in this ancient island to draw the sword against tyranny. People never gave up, Churchill said. They believed that they could win and release themselves from what he said was the jaws of death and the mouth of hell. Despite Britain coming out of the war with tremendous empire-ruining debts to the USA, Churchill talked fondly about the nation across that so-called pond. We must turn ourselves to fulfill our duty to our own countrymen and to our gallant allies of the United States who were so foully and treacherously attacked by Japan. We will go hand in hand with them, even if it is a hard struggle we will not be the ones who will fail. Churchill reminded the world who the evil doers were and then talked about what he called the overwhelming power of the USA. He told people that the war wasn't over. More death and destruction were on the way. He said, We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing, but let us not forget for a moment the toil and efforts that lie ahead. Japan, with all her treachery and greed, remains unsubdued. The injury she has inflicted on Great Britain, the United States and other countries, and her detestable cruelties call for justice and retribution. As you know, justice and retribution manifested as two bombs named Fat Man and Little Boy dropped on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. On the 6th and 9th of August 1945, these two destroyers of worlds left Japan in a state of shock. Some parts of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were left a barren wasteland. Entire families were almost vaporized in their wooden houses. Playgrounds were reduced to ashes. Survivors were left with terrible burns. The world had never seen anything like it. These survivors, the Hibakusha, sought medical care, but supplies were low, and many of the medical staff in the area were either dead or close to it. Much of the rest of the world celebrated when on September 2, 1945, Japan surrendered. 418,500 Americans were dead. As many as 230,000 Japanese people died because of those bombs and somewhere between 2.6 and 3.1 million Japanese soldiers and civilians lost their lives in the war. The country was down on its knees. The feeling of shame pervaded every household and military office. People sat in their living rooms, tears spilling from their eyes, as Emperor Hirohito told them it was over. Part of his speech went, The enemy has begun to employ a new and most cruel bomb, the power of which to do damage is indeed incalculable taking the toll of many innocent lives. Should we continue to fight, not only would it result in an ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but it would also lead to the total extinction of human civilization. At that same time, US President Harry Truman told his people 
that a mighty threat to civilization had been laid to rest. He said the evil done by the Japanese warlords can never be repaired or forgotten, but their power to destroy and kill has been taken from them. They were impotent, he said, their wings clipped, their dreams had been disfigured. Since Japan had attacked Pearl Harbor, it had inflicted misery upon misery on the American people. But now the winner, said Truman, was liberty, the freedom of the individual, and the personal dignity of man. You can be sure that many Americans weren't overly upset about the destruction and loss of life those bombs caused. Most didn't criticize the powers that be over the decision to use them. In 1945, the approval rating for using them was 85%. Only 29% of Americans said the bombing was unjustified. 64% of Japanese people said the wholesale murder was unwarranted. If you look at polls today, you'll find some big differences. Now, only about half of Americans say Japan had to be bombed with the nukes. It seems over the decades, fewer and fewer people have endorsed the use of those bombs. In fact, many Americans today will tell you that laying waste to two Japanese cities with those most atrocious of inventions was disgusting. You'll find plenty of people that hate war and violence. They despise the vicissitudes of politics that make wars possible and send mainly poor people to an early grave. They will not defend war in general and they will be the first to let you know that the imperialist nature of some nations is a blight on the human race. Still, these same people will also tell you that little man and fat boy's mess was a necessary evil. Lest we forget, let us remind you what was going on at the end of World War II. And please be reminded in this caveat that trying to understand the use of nuclear weapons is not the same as outright endorsing atomic warfare. Japan had committed untold atrocities. What happened in China can only be described as gruesome. The human experimentation at the secret Unit 731 was beyond horrific. POWs were suffering in the internment camps, and this was mostly all behind the scenes, a kind of underground war that was going on. Japan thought it was fighting for its way of life. Like Hitler, the country believed that the Western world was destroying the planet. A new order had to be established, one which Japan thought it was capable of leading, in Asia at least. So the people of Japan clung to this belief in their superiority. It was an ideological war and so they were willing to fight to the bitter end. This is perhaps no better exemplified than by the kamikaze pilots who purposefully crashed their planes into American ships. For the US soldiers who witnessed it, it wasn't just petrifying, but it showed them they were fighting against impenetrable wills, so single-minded and stubborn that they'd fight to the very last man. We'll return to this because it's an essential element of the story. Weapons and strategy are one thing, but the will of a people is another. This will was evident on July 6, 1944, when Japan launched what was a futile charge, a human wave attack that the Allies called a bonsai attack. Japanese troops ran into bullets on an island in the Marianas, some of them armed with only shovels and sticks. About 3,000 men were in the charge and most of them died. A US soldier later said it was like a cattle stampede. He added, they just kept coming and coming, I thought they'd never stop. Some of those lying on the ground with bullets in their chests invited the Americans to go over to them, grenades hidden in their hands. They outright refused to become prisoners to what they believed was American scum. When the Third Reich fell, Japan just buckled down even more. Britain and its colonies were now winning the war from the Pacific, with the last days of the campaign in Burma costing the Allies a few hundred lives compared to the tens of thousands of Japanese lives lost in the feudal defense. Major General Curtis LeMay of the American Air Force led an attack on the Japanese mainland, mainly possible because the Americans had now taken islands close enough to the Axis power to make bombing campaigns possible. On March 9, 1945, he ordered an air raid on Tokyo consisting of 325 B-29 Super Fortress bombers. Only 12 of them were shot down. Tokyo was turned into a hellscape. The Americans wanted blood. They knew they'd be killing civilians. Today, that would be a war crime, but they thought that if Tokyo was lit up, the Japanese would finally back down. They were dead wrong. Everywhere you looked, there were burned out cars and stacks of charred bodies, women and children lying in the streets. It was total carnage. It was highly unethical, but it didn't change how the Japanese felt about surrendering. The Americans were in no mood for a compromise. They lost 7,184 of their men in battle to secure the island of Iwo Jima. 12,500 American troops died in the Battle of Okinawa. The Japanese generals didn't think the Americans could stand much more. They knew they'd lose far more men, far more civilians, but they'd bet that the Americans would negotiate when they realized asking Japan to surrender was futile. On the waves, Japanese kamikaze pilots were raising hell. After all, they rarely missed their target. 
Commander Stephen Jerica of the USS Franklin said it was blood curdling out in the ocean. He said, I saw destroyers get hit, burst into flames, men jumping over the side to avoid the flames. Japan was bleeding too, but the attacks did not stop. One US pilot said the Tokyo raid looked like Dante's Inferno. The attacks just kept coming, one after another, and the bodies kept piling up. The Americans then hit Kobe. One night, they destroyed around 300,000 homes in Osaka, killing thousands of civilians. This wasn't just a war, it was a massacre. It was ordinary families paying the price. For every American bomber that went up, about 100 Japanese civilians died. It was clear what was happening. The US was punishing Japan for its past aggression. The US soldiers kept wondering when all this mayhem would finally stop. Japan had lost, they thought. So why did they keep coming at us? How can they send planes crashing into our ships? A commander named Fitzhugh Lee said life on the high seas with those kamikaze pilots was not very comfortable at all. He recalled, it was interesting psychologically, my first experience of real fear, being in the face of what you thought might be death at any moment. Letters home suggested that the Japanese troops would never stop. One guy, Hayashi Inchiso, wrote to his parents saying, All men born in Japan are destined to die fighting for their country. You have done a splendid job raising me to become an honorable man. I will do a splendid job sinking an enemy aircraft carrier. Do brag about me. He, like many Japanese, hated the Americans. Of course, he didn't even know any Americans, but such was the power of propaganda. Like in all nations, the owners of industry and the people of great wealth could see past the propaganda, but the pawns on the chessboard of war could not. It might be hard for you to comprehend, but what the Americans were for the Japanese, Hitler was to the Americans. The Japanese civilians believed the Americans were the boogeymen, there to upset their culture and enslave them to a decadent culture. This is why they wouldn't stop. All civilians heard all day on the radio were stories of the beast coming to destroy their way of life. These people put their hands on their hearts and promised never to submit. Back in the US, roundtable meetings were being held to discuss the use of the atomic bomb. From July 14th to July 16th, a meeting was held by none other than Robert Oppenheimer, the so-called father of the atomic bomb. At the end of the meeting, he declared that some people were against using the bomb and that it would make the world prejudiced against the US. He added, others emphasized the opportunity of saving American lives by immediate military use and believe that such will improve international prospects. Some leaders just didn't understand the gravity of the situation. Some thought that Japan would fight on even if the bombs were dropped. Some knew what would happen, but said there was no alternative. That becomes more understandable when you hear what General Yoshiro Umezu said in a newspaper that was published May 1945. He wrote, the sure path to victory in a decisive battle lies in uniting the resources of the empire behind the war effort and in mobilizing the full strength of the nation. He finished by saying it was still possible to annihilate the American invaders. Japan was being bussed up. So many people were now homeless, their loved ones lying deep in the ground. Their houses were still burning when the people heard that the war was far from over, and if the people just tried, the American devils could still be beaten. In June, Major Yoshitaka Hori delivered a speech to army cadets, warning them of losing the will to fight. He told the cadets officer that when he speaks to them, he must end on a high note assuring them the Japanese Imperial Army is still in the fighting mood. So, do you really think Japan was ready to surrender? Some Japanese politicians actually wanted to. Some parts of the public did, but not the generals. The generals were still gung-ho about kicking America's butt. For sure, dropping those bombs was an awful thing to do, but just as we can blame Hitler for putting Germans through hell, we can blame the Japanese generals for causing needless deaths. Many Americans in the know, including Truman, believed the bombs were the only way of sparing lives. Soon, a plane named Enola Gay was rolling through Tenian in the recently captured Mariana Islands. Some of the younger soldiers rightly pointed out that this B-29 bomber didn't look like the other ones. It had been modified. They had no idea why, but they knew something was different, and that something important was happening. A 19-year-old soldier was brave enough to ask what was going on with the plane, and when he asked why it was there, he was told that the Americans were about to win the war. There was a breathless excitement around the place, but very few people knew what was actually about to go down. The Japanese were still dogged when they were about to get hit by the most powerful weapons in the world. The Soviets were about to march into Manchuria, one and a half million troops walking alongside 5,500 tanks. The Soviets, perhaps understandably, would not be friendly to their captives in Manchuria. 300,000 Japanese POWs were about to die there. In Japan's burned-out cities, families were still proudly saying that Japanese men never surrender. Some still held on to the slogan, do not live in shame as a prisoner, die and leave no ignominious crime behind you. 
Now their beliefs were going to be tested like never before. The US, now easily the wealthiest and most powerful nation on Earth, as one military man later pointed out, was about to cease being innocent and good without qualification. Boom. Boom. Before we start part two of this show, we'll let you listen to the words of a British writer, the famous Charles Dickens of Oliver Twist fame. In his book on the French Revolution called A Tale of Two Cities, there are some rather wise words at the beginning. They are related to what was going on in France, but they work just as well for the end of World War II. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. This sums up what happened in Japan. The Americans knew Japan wouldn't give up the fight, otherwise they wouldn't have used the atomic bombs. But as you know, many people were against employing world-wrecking high-tech bombs. That's why a land invasion had been planned, involving mostly the US but also the UK and other allies. The invasion was called Operation Downfall, which would have cost many, many lives because you can bet that Japan would have thrown everything at the Americans. It consisted of two main attacks, one called Operation Olympic and the other Operation Coronet. In November 1945, through Operation Olympic, the US intended to take the island of Kyushu. It had just captured the island of Okinawa in a bloody fight and so the US could launch further attacks from these islands. You must remember that capturing Okinawa had been no walk in the park. The 82-day conflict was brutal for all involved. That's why the Japanese named it the Violent Wind of Steel. More lives were lost in this battle than any other in the Pacific, with the Japanese losing in the region of 120,000 men and the US around 12,000. These were just the military casualties too. The Japanese had their local men and women dress up in uniform and equip them with a gun. For some, this would be the first time they shot a weapon. It's thought that just about half of the 300,000 folks that lived on that island perished. Some of them were just kids. It was a bloodbath. But as you know, the majority of Japanese people thought that their way of life was under threat from a greedy, catastrophically consumerist nation which put little value on respecting social order. A US naval vice admiral couldn't have put it better when he said, There was a hypnotic fascination to the sight so alien to our Western philosophy. We watched each plunging kamikaze with the detached horror of one witnessing a terrible spectacle rather than as the intended victim. We forgot self for a moment as we groped hopelessly for the thought of that other man up there. Again, we can't say enough about the Japanese mindset and how it was different from the American mindset. It reminds us of some things Colonel Kurt said in the movie Apocalypse Now. Kurtz recalls just how far the enemy would go to win, which included chopping off the arms of the recently inoculated. Its own people. Kurtz knows that if you have soldiers that are willing to do anything, you can beat anything. He says, and I realized, like I was shot, like I was shot with a diamond, a diamond bullet right through my forehead, and I thought, my god, the genius of that, the genius. The will to do that, perfect, genuine, complete, crystalline, pure. He said the men fought with their full hearts, more than any American was capable of, men whose hearts were still partly back home with their lovers and apple pie. Kurt said, you have to have men who are moral, and at the same time, who were able to utilize their primordial instincts to kill without feeling, without passion, without judgment. Oh, the horror. And when those American soldiers saw the Japanese kamikaze pilots flying at them, and they saw children gritting their teeth as they ran to gunfire, all seeming so normal to them, they knew they could never do the same. Their moral judgment precluded that. The Japanese were not monsters, but they were willing to fight in a way many Americans would not have been able to, with a totally impervious will. With that in mind, how do you think Operation Downfall would have gone down? We should say again, with other allies involved, while the Americans were distrustful of Joseph Stalin, the Soviet Union was there to offer help, as were the Brits and their Commonwealth countries, just as soon as they could get enough troops over there. The Americans alone would send around 450,000 troops for the invasion of Kyushu. But intelligence said the Japanese had around 600,000 troops ready to protect the island. That number would have likely increased to 900,000 all of them more than willing to fight to the death. All over the island, they had hidden machine gun positions. They also had booby traps all over the place. They had pilots at the ready who were willing to fly into American ships and troops. This was already arranged in a defense plan called Operation Katsuko. Still, the Americans would have deployed just about every bomber they had. Scores of B-29s, B-17s, and B-24s would have filled the sky. Battleships would have filled the ocean. Back on the island, the Japanese would have been coming in waves, bonsai, and the Americans 
would have kept shooting them down, all the time wondering how these men could just keep coming. Like automatons programmed to destroy, the Japanese would not have stopped. This battle would have been much worse than in Okinawa, and the Americans would have taken the island eventually. But by God, there would have been a lot of casualties. We say this without speculating what mayhem the Pacific Typhoon would have caused. And this would have just been the start. With the British on site, we can compare it to the invasion of Normandy, Operation Overlord. Still, Operation Downfall would have been vastly bigger in terms of manpower, arms, and the buckets of blood that would have seeped into the soil. Japan wouldn't have been able to get all of its troops out of China and Manchuria, but you can be sure the entire available military plus citizens would have been thrown at the Americans and British. After all, this was to save the country. France would have been nothing in comparison. Millions of Japanese soldiers and civilians would have fought against the invasion. To add to that, Japan never successfully had been invaded, and this was a country with a collective mindset. Women would have run at the enemy armed with brooms and wooden spoons. Children would have thrown mud bombs at soldiers. Even the dogs would have joined in. That's a joke before you comment below. Nonetheless, everything rested on Japan defending the first attack on Kyushu. But let's just say the British and American troops were successful. What then? You must now think about some Japanese propaganda that had been embraced for some time. It talked about the glorious death of 100 million and basically said that all Japanese civilians should fight if it came to it. The people were told it was glorious to die for the Holy Emperor of Japan, and every Japanese man, woman, and child should die for the Emperor when the Allies arrived. Many of these people really believed that. They told each other that it was better to die than be enslaved by what they called the White Devils. Not that all Allied troops were white by a long way. At the same time, the Japanese had around 10,000 planes left. 2,000 of them would go on kamikaze missions, with the Japanese military commander saying they expected to sink at least 400 American ships. We should say that the US intelligence estimated the Japanese to have over 12,000 aircraft, of which they said half would be kamikazes. The Japanese also had their own fleet of ships from which they could launch attacks, not to mention all their submarines. We might add that they had kamikaze-like ships, too. These were the 3300 Shinyo boats, each of which was willing to blow itself up when close enough to an American ship. Their navy even had frogmen that were willing to die for the cause. These were the Fukuryu, a very suitable word it seems. These guys would swim with explosives and blow themselves up when they reached US landing crafts. Ok, so we have a fleet of ships, we have 10,000 planes, 2,000 of which will likely hit their targets when they crash into American ships and landing positions. There would be over 1 million soldiers plus another 28 million volunteer fighting corps. These were men aged 15 to 60 and women aged 17 to 40, 2.4 million people living in Kyushu alone. These were civilians, not soldiers, but they would have joined the fight. A lot of ugliness would have taken place too, with chemical weapons being a mainstay in this invasion. Under the Geneva Protocol, that sort of thing was outlawed, but the Japanese and Americans hadn't bothered to sign it. We should also add that it goes without saying that the 30-odd thousand American POWs would have been slaughtered in camps after the invasion started, along with the Brits and other Allied POWs. Once Kyushu was in the hands of the Allies, they would have gone forward with Operation Cornet, Part 2 of Operation Olympic. This was the invasion of Kanto Plain not far from Tokyo. And then, wham bam thank you ma'am, the Allies would be running all over Japan. The US 1st Army and 8th Army, with Brits and British Commonwealth at their side, would have stormed the beaches just as they'd done when they were about to take France back from Germany. Then on to Tokyo, stir for a while, sprinkle on some air raids, add a dash of chemical weapons and put that in the oven until doomsday. Job done. Here's how the humans destroy millions of precious eggs for an omelette that they never wanted. But not so fast. The devastation that would have happened to get this far is beyond our comprehension. You already know how many Japanese planes and ships would have had to been destroyed to make this happen, and so you know how much damage that would have also caused to the Americans and British. To put it this way, news reports back in the US would have been like reading the Diary of the Devil. The US forecast that the Battle of Kyushu would have cost about 38,000 American lives. These were people expected to be killed in action, with many more US troops dying of disease. The list of total casualties would have been in the region of 180,000. The War Department said to successfully invade Japan and finally get the Emperor down on his knees, 400,000 to 800,000 Americans would have had to die. But with Japanese civilians joining in the war and their houses getting bombed for weeks on end, it was estimated that 5 to 10 million of the total Japanese population would also die in the process. And that was a good chunk of the country. The destruction would have been so monstrous that Japan would have had to build up again from its ruined foundations. American families with collectively around half a million lost sons 
would have been asking why the military didn't use the bombs. Make no mistake, Japan would have lost. How could it fight the power of the US, not to mention the British Navy, the British Task Force, and the RAF, all working alongside the British Commonwealth nations, the Canadians, the Indians, the Australians, and more? Then, if the Soviets attacked, well, Japan wouldn't have had a chance in hell. But as we've seen in other wars, a people that are willing to fight until the end will indubitably lead mass death on a frightening scale. The Allies wouldn't have pulled out, though. The stakes were too high. This was not Vietnam. This was a world war that had to be wrapped up. We can think of no better two words than the horror. Perhaps the epitome of human negligence and human intelligence are weapons we've created to destroy the world. One of our biggest scientific achievements in history is splitting the atom, and we use this achievement to create a destroyer of worlds. Still, maybe without those bombs, there would have been much more carnage in Japan and possibly more world wars decades after. Perhaps those two bombs that fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki prevented what would have become a much gorier ending. It's certainly a paradox of human nature that we must create cataclysmic weapons to protect ourselves from ourselves and keep the peace. A man watches the first nuclear explosion in human history successfully go off, transforming the world with the beginning of the atomic age. A few words come to mind from the ancient Hindu text known as the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. It would have been impossible without him, the father of the atomic bomb, J. Robert Oppenheimer, but who was he? Was he a merchant of death, the designer of the deadliest weapon of all time? Or was he a principled scientist who hoped to prevent future wars? Was he a dedicated American patriot who wanted to make sure his homeland got the weapon that could finish the Axis powers? Or was he a secret ally of the United States' next great enemy? The answer isn't clear, and to find the truth we have to go back to the beginning. Julius Robert Oppenheimer's story begins in New York City on April 22, 1904. He was born into a non-observant Jewish family. His mother worked as a painter while his father was an impressive man in his own right, a wealthy textile importer who had immigrated to America from Prussia in 1888. The family would soon be joined by J. Robert's younger brother Frank, and they would move to an impressive apartment on the Upper West Side. Between L. Oppenheimer's love for art and Julius's wealth, it was no surprise that the apartment was soon covered with some of the most famous works of art in the world, including paintings by Picasso and Van Gogh. But the family would ultimately be known for science, not art. As J. Robert and Frank began their elementary studies, they were sent to a prep school, but not just any prep school. In 1911, J. Robert entered the Ethical Culture Society School, an experimental school founded by social reformer Felix Adler. Its goal was not just to raise smart children, but smart children grounded in ethics who would go on to do great things. It was part of a large secular humanist movement that was gaining momentum in education by the early 20th century, and it would heavily influence the lives of the Oppenheimer sons. But while J. Robert would learn much about ethics in school, his interests lay in academics. He would breeze through his studies, gaining a particular interest in mineralogy and, of course, chemistry. He even skipped several grades, and by the time he was 18, he was ready to take his next step. Because Oppenheimer was going to Harvard. Despite being derailed by a serious illness he got while prospecting in Europe, which delayed his plans by a year, J. Robert Oppenheimer was ready for the Ivy League. However, while he was recovering, he spent time in New Mexico, where he would fall in love with the Southwest. This was a region he would come back to in the future, of course, but for now, he was happy to return to New England. While he gained a general education at Harvard, he aggressively sought advanced chemistry courses and even sought to make up for the year he was delayed by taking extra classes. He was so ambitious that he decided to switch to physics for graduate school and was admitted solely on the basis of his independent studies, skipping multiple entry-level courses. In only three years, he would graduate Harvard with honors. But his education was just beginning. Nearly dying in Europe didn't deter Oppenheimer from crossing the Atlantic once more as he decided to attend Christ's College in Cambridge. While he was rejected by his initial choice of laboratory mentor Ernest Rutherford, he decided simply to head to England anyway and just try to hustle his way into another internship while he was already there. He was ultimately accepted by British Nobel laureate J.J. Thomson, who found Oppenheimer's mind sharp but his lab discipline lacking. Oppenheimer was assigned a tutor to get him up to speed on lab procedures, something he loathed. It would be a common pattern in Oppenheimer's life. He was a genius, but one who didn't like to be told to do things the slow way but he also displayed a few dark tendencies. Oppenheimer's tutor, Patrick Blackett, was a disciplined man and only a few years older than Oppenheimer. The two clashed, and at one point Oppenheimer doused an apple with noxious chemicals and left it for Blackett to eat. This nearly led to Oppenheimer being placed on academic probation, but things were smoothed over. 
It wasn't the only time Oppenheimer displayed strange behavior patterns. The young scientist was obsessive about his work, often neglecting his basic needs when he was obsessed with the puzzle. He smoked intensely, forgot to eat, and once reportedly strangled a friend when the friend shared the news that he was engaged. It would be the start of a life of psychological issues for Oppenheimer, but he was unconcerned by the difficulties this would cause. After all, as he once told his younger brother, I need physics more than friends. But even this challenging environment would not prove enough for Oppenheimer's curiosity and ambition, and he would soon head to one of the world's hubs for physics, Germany. He enrolled in the University of Göttingen in 1926 to study under the legendary Max Born. Often known as the father of quantum mechanics, Born was a sought-after mentor who attracted some of the best minds in the world, including German theoretical physicist Werner Heisenberg and Italian nuclear scientist Enrico Fermi. Oppenheimer had finally found a place where he could truly be challenged, and he was enthusiastic about his studies, maybe too enthusiastic. He would take over seminars with his passionate rhetoric, and a group of students at one point threatened to boycott the class unless Born managed to quiet Oppenheimer down. But dark clouds were brewing. Oppenheimer studied in Germany at the height of the Weimar era, when Germany was becoming a post-war hub of culture, industry, art, and science, albeit one struggling with a devastated economy after the First World War. But intolerance was rising, and Oppenheimer no doubt felt it as a Jewish man. No one knows what kind of Nazi oppression he experienced during this time, but it didn't leave him inclined to stick around. He earned his doctorate at the young age of 23 in 1927, not before reportedly interrogating his test administrator. He and Born co-published a famous paper, The Born-Oppenheimer Approximation, which presented a method for neglecting nuclear motion in calculations without losing much accuracy. And then it was time for him to depart. Oppenheimer had left America as an ambitious and troubled student and returned a famous physicist who was highly in demand, so in demand that there was soon a fight over exactly where he would land. The United States National Research Council wanted him to join their team at Caltech, while Harvard wanted him back working for them. Oppenheimer, not liking to be told what to do, predictably went down his own path and split his fellowship between the two universities on both coasts. While at Caltech, he would become friends with fellow physicist Linus Pauling, but a potential affair between Oppenheimer and Pauling's wife brought an end to that. The two would never work together again, not just because of personal disputes, but because Oppenheimer's future was destined to stay away from Pauling's pacifist beliefs. Fate had a different plan for Oppenheimer. He soon began to work as a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, but not before some more travels in Europe and then purchasing a ranch in New Mexico. As a professor, Oppenheimer was known to be eccentric and hard to get to know. His students were notorious for becoming extremely invested in his classes, often adopting his mannerisms and spending more time on his assignments than any other. He continued to push the boundaries of physical science, often collaborating with the government. In his personal life, he was known to be apolitical and disinterested in world affairs at first. So invested in his own studies, he reportedly didn't even learn about the Great Depression until six months after it began. But then, something changed. By 1934, Oppenheimer had become aware of politics and was particularly passionate about opposing the fascist tide sweeping Europe. As the Nazis took power, Oppenheimer dedicated a portion of his salary to supporting German scientists who wanted to escape Germany. He also would become involved in union affairs and raise money for various left-wing caucuses. This led to many people wondering if he was becoming another member of the US Communist Party, which was growing in support among academic circles, but this accusation had little to no backing. Oppenheimer was never much for romance either, but that was about to change. Oppenheimer's turn to the left coincided with him getting involved with women who shared his views. First was Jean Tatlock, a daughter of a Berkeley literature professor and radical journalist. The two had a short but passionate relationship, and it would be less than a year later before he would meet Kitty Puning. Another young radical, she was married when she had an affair with Oppenheimer and quickly divorced her husband and took off with a physicist. Looks like J. Robert Oppenheimer embraced more than one type of chemistry during his professor years. And the new Catherine Oppenheimer would be a key influence on her husband. Catherine was much more than a political activist. Born in Prussia, she would become a renowned biologist and botanist in her own right. She was also deeply involved in several radical groups. She and Oppenheimer would have two children, but Oppenheimer's issues with personal relationships cropped up again. He would have affairs with Tatlock while married. This meant he was essentially cheating on one communist with another, and this frequent contact with members of the party would come back to haunt him, because he was about to undergo the most critical job interview of his life. As the Nazi party consolidated its control over Germany and then launched World War II, Oppenheimer only became more dedicated to opposing them. 
but his own government wasn't exactly on his side either. The FBI opened a file on Oppenheimer in 1941, chronicling all his contact with members of the Communist Party. While they didn't find that he engaged in any criminal conduct, they did find that he was a member of multiple organizations they considered subversive, including the now mainstream American Civil Liberties Union. Oppenheimer was not targeted by law enforcement, but he was put on a list of potential targets for custodial detention in the event of a national emergency, aka if civil liberties were suspended. But the government was about to need him for a very different reason. By October 1941, the US was still neutral, only supplying the Allies with the equipment they needed. But everyone knew that sooner or later the US would come and join the fray. The sneak attack on Pearl Harbor wasn't on anyone's mind, but it was clear that the imperial ambitions of the Axis powers would keep growing. So not only was President Franklin Roosevelt planning for war, he was planning for the next big weapon, an atomic bomb. National Defense Research Committee Chairman James B. Conant was put in charge of the early phases, and he had previously been a lecturer at Harvard when Oppenheimer was studying there, so he knew his old student had a mind that needed to be on board with this plan if it was to succeed. And soon, the project would become vital to the U.S. war plan. When Oppenheimer was first brought on board, he was tasked with doing neutron calculations. While Oppenheimer was definitely working on the building blocks of an atomic bomb, it was all very theoretical, and he threw himself into it with his typical zeal for physics puzzles. Security wasn't nearly as tight at this point, and he even shared many of his theories with students at Berkeley. But now, the U.S. was at war, and in June 1942, the Manhattan Project was founded. The scientific efforts were transferred to the military, and Oppenheimer was chosen to head the project. This was an odd choice for many people. Oppenheimer didn't have a Nobel Prize, didn't have any background in the military, and was seen as a theoretical genius without practical applications. But the new leader of the military division, Brigadier General Leslie Groves, was steadfast in his choice, defending Oppenheimer against concerns that he was a political liability. And this would bring Oppenheimer back to his second home. While the Manhattan Project was still in its early stages, everyone knew their final goal was to set off an atomic bomb. This would require a safe location, far away from any nearby cities, and that called Oppenheimer to New Mexico. They took over the site of a private school near Santa Fe, and the Los Alamos Ranch School became the Los Alamos Laboratory. While this was a very isolated location with poor water supply and few road connections, the government went to work building the infrastructure required for the base. With the military taking charge, the scientists involved were expected to be commissioned into the military. There was just one problem. J. Robert Oppenheimer was not military material. The problem wasn't that he would likely argue constantly with his commanding officer, it was that he was underweight and had a chronic cough due to past bouts of tuberculosis. This, along with several other scientists objecting to being commissioned, led to a compromise where Los Alamos would be operated by the University of California under the supervision of the War Department, and the project soon grew by leaps and bounds, with several thousand people being involved in development over the years. And they weren't all just from the United States either. Many German scientists who defected joined the project, and they brought with them intelligence from Nazi Germany. Hitler was known for his grandiose plans and was just as ambitious when it came to weapons as the Americans. It was well known that he wanted a nuclear bomb of his own, but no one knew how far along the Nazi efforts were. It was only after the war that it was found that they were nowhere near the Americans, but this caused a great sense of urgency in the Manhattan Project, and some additional projects were proposed. A plan to poison German food supplies with radioactive material was rejected, not because of ethical reasons, but because the scientists believed that it couldn't be done on a large enough scale. And a plutonium-powered gun, nicknamed Thin Man, was developed, but ultimately trashed, because reactor-produced plutonium was found to have too high a concentration for use in a gun, which meant that there was only one project left to focus on. Oppenheimer shifted his focus to an implosion-type weapon that would compress the explosive material and be delivered via a simple device. This was the bomb that would become Little Boy, the very first nuclear bomb ever dropped in combat. But first, they needed to make sure it worked. The final design was delivered on February 28, 1945. As it became clear the government would actually achieve their goal, commissions were formed to determine whether it would eventually be used in combat and how it would be handled after the war but first they needed to make sure it worked. It was July 16, 1945, and years of hard work were about to come to a close. The scientists had completed the first nuclear bomb prototype, and it would be detonated deep in the New Mexico desert. The site was nicknamed Trinity, and Oppenheimer was one of the many scientists present to see their experiments come to fruition, or result in shocking failure. 
Oppenheimer was accompanied at the test by not just military officials, but his brother, Frank, now an acclaimed scientist in his own right. No one knew what would happen when the bomb went off. Maybe the device would be a dud, or maybe it would be all too successful, creating a devastating explosion that would not be contained. But Oppenheimer no doubt was confident he had never seen a puzzle he couldn't crack. But even he wasn't prepared for what he was about to see. As the last seconds ticked by and the announcer shouted, now, the bomb went off and there was a massive burst of light. This was followed seconds later by a deep roar as the sound of the explosion hit them. Oppenheimer reportedly relaxed, the fear of failure leaving him. According to Frank, his first words after were, I guess it worked. A suitably practical response for a man of science. But in the years to come, Oppenheimer would admit very different words came to mind. The Bhagavad Gita phrase, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, flowed into his mind as the enormity of the moment came over him. The deadliest weapon in human history had just been tested and he was its creator. But now it was out of his hands. Oppenheimer had little regrets at first about his role in designing the bomb and hoped it would help to eliminate the despicable Hitler. There was just one problem, the war in Europe was over. Nazi Germany had been defeated through the efforts of the Allies and the Soviet Union, and Germany was currently under military occupation. But the war with Japan was still raging on, and the United States was eager to test their new weapon in combat. As Japan had still not surrendered, and plans were underway to mount a ground invasion, it was determined to instead drop the first bomb, Little Boy, on the infrastructure-heavy city of Hiroshima. It devastated the city and killed over 100,000 people. But the US wasn't finished yet. It was only days later when a second larger bomb was dropped over Nagasaki and Japan surrendered soon after. But while the nuclear scientists were happy to see the US triumph, many were horrified by this, seeing the second bombing as unnecessary overkill. Oppenheimer in particular was haunted by his role in the Manhattan Project, even as the war ended and the boys came marching home. It was a few months later when he was granted a meeting with President Truman and expressed the opinion that he felt like he had blood on his hands. Truman did not respond well, seeing it as an insult against the president's call to drop the bomb. He kicked Oppenheimer out of the White House, but still awarded him a Medal for Merit the following year. And now a new era would begin for J. Robert Oppenheimer. The Manhattan Project was highly classified throughout the war, but the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki made it all very clear. The government declassified many of the details in the year after the war, including the identity of the man who made it possible. And then suddenly, Oppenheimer was the one thing he never expected to be, a celebrity. He appeared on magazine covers and found just about everyone seeking his opinion. The problem was, the government might not always like his opinion. He started advocating for international control of nuclear arms. To prevent an arms race, he wanted more power to go to the newly formed United Nations. And so, J. Robert Oppenheimer's time with the government would come to an awkward end. He returned to teaching, but found he couldn't go back to his old habits. Instead, he took up a position as the head of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, an ambitious institution that played host to some of the greatest minds of the era, including Albert Einstein. He finally had a setting that could challenge him again, and it didn't hurt that it came with accommodations, including a 17th century mansion that came with servants and allowed him to indulge in his parents' passion for collecting artwork. Now that the war was over, Oppenheimer was able to return to theoretical work, his true passion. But it wouldn't last long, and the government came calling again. In the year after the war, the US wanted to avoid an arms race and to keep the US monopoly over nuclear power. Oppenheimer was appointed to a commission to determine global standards for nuclear power, and a plan was developed to oversee enforcement, including requiring inspections of other countries' resources. This was rejected by the Soviets, and the arms race was on. Oppenheimer would soon be appointed as head of the new Atomic Energy Commission, helping to determine policy and ensure safety standards. But it soon became clear he was out of step with the government, recommending restraint as the government plowed toward a full-on arms race. The Soviets tested their first atomic bomb in 1949, and it would be all downhill from there. The government wanted more and stronger nuclear weapons, including the first hydrogen bomb. This thermonuclear weapon would dwarf the previous bombs in power, and Oppenheimer strongly recommended against proceeding with it. Not only were the human casualties horrifying to him, but he knew this would cause an arms race that would potentially endanger the survival of the human race. Oppenheimer convinced the commission to reject the plans, and then they were overruled by Truman. He would stay involved, but it was clear Oppenheimer was no longer in charge of the US nuclear program. With his battle to stop the arms race lost, Oppenheimer shifted his focus to minimizing the impact. He wrote reports on the dangers of nuclear fallout and helped to develop plans for the first nuclear alert system and air defense program. He worked with the State Department on global disarmament, attempting to prevent thermonuclear testing. 
but it was clear the military was calling the shots now, and the Cold War with the Soviet Union was in full swing. And as the Cold War ramped up, so did suspicion. Oppenheimer was still highly influential and was having a major impact in terms of making people aware of the dangers of the weapons he had helped create. That gained him a lot of enemies, not just in the military, but in other branches of the government. They included J. Edgar Hoover, the ambitious head of the FBI, who had been trailing Oppenheimer and investigating his ties to communists since before the war. Hoover was convinced Oppenheimer was a covert member of the party, and clearly the fact that Oppenheimer didn't want America to have the biggest and deadliest bombs possible meant that he was in league with the Soviets, and now Oppenheimer's moment of truth had arrived. Few things were more feared in the early days of the Cold War than a summons from the House Un-American Activities Committee. And in June 1949, it was Oppenheimer's turn. He was questioned by the House Committee about his links to the Communist Party USA, including the fact that many of his mentors and students had affiliations to the party. He maintained that he never belonged to the party, but his brother Frank admitted he was affiliated. And that led to him losing his job at the University of Minnesota and being thrown out of the physics community. But J. Robert Oppenheimer had escaped mostly unscathed. For now. If there was one thing J. Edgar Hoover hated, it was losing a match with a target. He would wait several more years, but in November 1953, Hoover received a letter claiming that Oppenheimer was not only a communist, but an agent of the Soviet Union. Things moved quickly after that, as Oppenheimer's security clearance was suspended and he was told to resign. Oppenheimer refused, demanding a formal hearing instead. A secret hearing held in 1954 saw no actual proof of Oppenheimer not being loyal to the US, but many officials reported on his anti-nuclear opinions and odd behavior, and in the end, the government got what they wanted. While Oppenheimer was never prosecuted, he was essentially done in government work. Oppenheimer testified freely about his affiliation with party members, to the point where it bordered on naming names, but it wasn't enough to save his role in the government. Most historians believe that he at least had sympathies for the communists but never acted on them beyond affiliations with American leftists. In the years after losing his government credentials, Oppenheimer seemed to slip into retirement, spending time in the US Virgin Islands, but eventually he would return to advocacy, campaigning against dangerous science. But he kept a low profile in the anti-nuclear movement. But his last act was coming sooner than anyone knew. Oppenheimer was eventually welcomed back in some form by the government, being given an award by John F. Kennedy. But only a few years later, he would be diagnosed with throat cancer. After two years of treatment, he passed away in February 1967 at the age of 62. His wife would follow him only five years later. And few men left a more complicated legacy. During the latter days of his life, Oppenheimer was rejected by many as a communist sympathizer. Today, anti-war activists often reject him as the man who unleashed the nuclear demon. His loyalties were complicated, but there is no evidence he ever aligned with the enemies of the United States or compromised its secrecy. He created the nuclear bomb and was then horrified by it. Today, Oppenheimer might be best understood as a man who would not rest until his questions were answered, only to see that some genies can't be put back in the bottle. The Earth shakes slightly around you, dirt falling to the floor from the shock of the explosion up above. 30 meters below the ground, you're safe from the exploding artillery shells, but there's always the fear that a lucky hit will land on just the right spot and bury you alive. It helps to shore up your tunnels with timbers, but the thought of a collapse is never far from your mind. You're on your knees, digging carefully with a small shovel through the hard dirt of northern France. The tunnel you're in is barely big enough to allow a man to stand crouched, and already on your sixth hour of an eight-hour shift of digging, you can't wait to get out and stretch your legs again. Of course, from the sound of it, at the moment you're probably in a much safer place down here beneath the earth than up above. The Great War started like most wars, politicians, alliances, misunderstandings, and a great amount of bluff and bluster from men who would have no actual part in the war that they would inevitably start. What nobody expected about this war, though, was just how damn difficult it would be to fight. In the years before the war, American-born and naturalized British inventor Hiram Stevens Maxim had developed what he called the Maxim Gun, a fully automatic machine gun capable of delivering very high rates of fire. Meeting a former American colleague in Vienna one day in 1882, his friend told him that if he really wanted to make money, he should invent something that would help Europeans kill each other much more efficiently, as they were so wanting to do already. Maxim lost little time licensing out his invention to the major governments of the world, from Britain to France and unfortunately Germany, whom he had no idea would eventually become a mortal enemy. All nations produced the Maxim gun under license, making their own improvements or modifications. At the start of the war, though, it was clear that the Allies had not taken the effectiveness of the machine gun to heart. 
quite as much as the Germans, who already fielded them in the thousands versus the few hundred that the British had at their disposal. Despite being outnumbered in quantity though, Allied machine guns managed to ensure that the quick victory Germany had hoped for would turn into a stalemate, as the soldiers dug into hundreds of miles of trenches all across France. The only way to budge the lines forward or backward any was the use of massive artillery bombardments followed by human wave infantry attacks. The results were predictably bloody and inefficient, and the war remained completely at a stalemate. Something, anything had to be done or this war might never end. And then both sides got the same idea, tunnels. Artillery barrages could do little against the men fortified inside their trenches. Unless a round managed a lucky hit directly inside a trench, it would mostly do nothing but daze the defenders safely tucked into their trenches. Even should a round score a direct hit though, the trenches were dug in such a manner that they took many sharp 90 degree turns, so that a single round landing inside a trench and exploding would kill at maximum 10 or 12 men. Poison gas was tried and continued to be used, and while that was initially very effective, the wide availability of chemical protective equipment such as gas masks soon began to erode the effectiveness of the tactic. Then there was the fact that gases could take a very long time to disperse from the low-lying trenches, making a follow-on assault extremely risky for your own men. And once more, there was the machine guns. Just a single survivor could man a machine gun and hold up an entire platoon of men charging across the barren no-man's land. Efforts quickly turned to tunneling underground, and you yourself helped to spearhead the tactic. The British army was quick to transfer experienced tunnelers from mines all across its empire to the front line, and the thousands of experienced miners soon took to training soldiers for the job. It's not just a dirty job though, it's an extremely dangerous one. The tunnels have to be dug quickly, and many of the safety measures one might take in a normal mine tunnel have to be foregone. Sometimes you're lucky to get sturdy timbers to use to shore up the roof as you work, sometimes not. And tunnel collapses are a constant worry, because the diggers typically work in pairs of two. A single collapse in a tunnel will kill both. Then there's the enemy to worry about. You might be safe from the artillery bombardments up above, but you're not completely safe from being exploded down here. It didn't take long for both sides to start digging counter tunnels, with diggers in those tunnels on the alert for enemy tunnelers heading their way. Even through the thick dirt, the sound of scraping shovels can be heard a good distance away, and once the enemy knows you're coming, he prepares a very nasty surprise for you in the form of a large mine. Set to explode remotely, the mine will obliterate you if you're close enough, but even if you're far from it, the shockwave can be enough to collapse your tunnel and bury you under tons of earth. You work carefully then, and as silently as possible. You're aware of the fact that somewhere ahead and above you there's likely a soldier who's stuck a long stick in the ground and bitten on it with his teeth. This allows him to detect the minute vibrations caused by your digging, though another favorite detection method involves putting a large oil barrel filled with water on the floor of the trench, and then having a soldier simply stick their ear in the water. The vibrations of your digging travel through the dirt and are amplified by the water, once more giving your approach away. Rather than talk, you use hand and arm signals, and you're grateful that at least you can use all the light you want. You shudder, thinking about what this life might be like if you were forced to dig in the pitch black. At your hip is a pistol and a knife, and those might seem ridiculously out of place for an observer, but the fact is, they could end up saving your life. Tunneling technology is rather primitive, and it's not unheard of for German or British tunnelers to dig straight into each other's tunnel. Once, you even heard a story of a German tunneler falling through the roof of a British tunnel. The encounters are brief and the fighting savage, and there's no cover and nowhere to hide in the tunnels. If pistols don't finish the job, then it comes down to shovels and knives. Up above, mechanized warfare may have brought the Great War to a screeching halt, but down here in the tunnels, war is waged in the ancient, savage ways. Today, you dig extra carefully, referencing your map frequently. You cannot afford to get caught because you're digging for the chance to break a stalemate that has lasted for years. It's June 1917, and 20 other teams have been digging for over a year in preparation for what may be the greatest surprise attack in human history. For the last three years, the Germans have held on to the Messina Ridge, a naturally fortified position that has given the German army command over a large swath of the land for miles. If the ridge can be taken, the German lines will be pushed back significantly. But every assault to date has been a dismal failure. The ridge is simply too well defended, and no man's land is littered with the remains of failed assaults. The plan to take the ridge devised by General Herbert Plummer is as audacious as it is simple. Dig 22 tunnels under the enemy position and explode massive mines directly underneath them. The survivors of the mine attack will be assaulted by an infantry assault. 
preceded by a creeping barrage artillery bombardment. On paper, it's a brilliant plan. In reality, it's incredibly risky to build so many tunnels and hope they remain undetected. Ten months ago, one of those tunnels was very much detected, with German counterminers detecting the tunnel. As the British diggers worked, the Germans set off a mine of their own, killing the miners and sealing off the tunnel. Plans to continue with the efforts on the 21 other tunnels were initially reconsidered, but ultimately given the go-ahead. Working much more carefully than before, you and the 20 other mining teams miraculously managed to finish the task. And with a few more shovelfuls of dirt, it's done. You check the map on the front lines again and do some quick calculations. Yep, you're there, 30 meters directly below the German trenches. You shudder, thinking about how close to the enemy you are. But then you hurry back up the tunnel. The next part will also require careful stealth, so no sense getting this far to only get discovered now. The attack will commence at 0310 hours on June 7th, and six hours before the attack, you help to wheel the massive 10,000-pound mine down the tunnel. As huge as it is, yours is actually one of the smaller mines. In total, 600 tons of explosives will be packed down below the unwitting Germans. As the massive mine is deposited at the end of the tunnel, you pack in the area behind it with sandbags, almost completely sealing off the mine from the rest of the tunnel. This is so that the force of the explosion is mostly forced upwards, through the soft earth, rather than backwards down the tunnel. The long electrical firing cable you run from the mine to the head of the shaft will allow you to detonate it remotely, and leaves nothing to chance. The world above your mine shaft has been a madhouse for over two weeks now. With the British and French guns firing on the German position since the 21st of May, thousands of rounds have been expended. And yet you know with their shelters dug deep into the earth, the artillery barrages have likely done little to weaken the Germans. As you wait by the entrance to your mine, the firing suddenly stops. Though you've spent most of your time underground for the last few months, you still grew accustomed to the constant dull explosions of artillery going off somewhere above your head. Now the silence that settles all across the front is almost unbearable. In their trenches, the Germans slowly begin to exit their shelters, curious about the lull in the bombardment. Five minutes later, at 0255 hours, it becomes clear that the shelling is over, and that means only one thing – an assault is coming. German soldiers scramble to their trenches and man their machine guns, shooting flares into the sky to light up the darkened no man's land. Yet, they see nothing. No charging soldiers or firing tanks. No man's land is empty. For a full 20 minutes, there is silence. Then, as your watch ticks over to 0310 hours, the world ends. The explosions aren't simultaneous. Each mine is laid at the end of a tunnel that's slightly longer or shorter than its counterparts, taking it a little bit more or less time for the firing signal to travel down the firing cord to the mine. Plus, though all of the men responsible for setting off their mines are carefully looking at their watches, each man is just a little bit faster or slower than the others in depressing the firing lever. What happens instead is a rapid series of 19 muffled staccato bursts, and then a single continuous roar that knocks you off your feet even a thousand meters away from the explosions. The earth underneath the Germans explodes outwards and upwards in a massive plume of stone and dirt, reaching hundreds of feet into the air. From your part of France, it seems like the entire German line has been overtaken by a single massive pillar of fire, and for a few seconds night has turned into day. The blast is so loud that it's heard by people all the way in London. In an instant, 10,000 Germans are killed in the massive explosions. The Germans would go on to be permanently routed from their positions on the vitally strategically important Messina Ridge, and in the coming weeks would actually end up losing more ground as they attempted to counterattack and were pushed back. Of the 21 mines laid down for the attack, only 19 were exploded as the other two ended up being outside of the planned attack area. The two remaining mines were left buried and forgotten until the 17th of June 1955 when one of them was detonated by a lightning bolt striking the earth. The only victim would be a cow, grazing directly above the mine. The second undetonated mine, however, is lost, and though its location is believed to be pinpointed, nobody yet has attempted to confirm it or recover the final unexploded mine of the Battle of Messina Ridge. As always, thanks for watching, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.